Special Operations, Covert Ops, Espionage, The Team House, with your hosts, Jack Murphy and David Park. Hi, everyone. Welcome to The Team House. This is episode 129. I'm Jack Murphy here with Dave Park. Our guest this evening is Mark Giaconia. He is the author of One Green Beret. I finished reading this book last weekend. It was super interesting, a super detailed account of Mark's career serving in Bosnia, Kosovo, and then going into Iraq ahead of the 2003 invasion, doing the advanced force operations mission, uh, and then participating in the actual invasion and attack on Ansar al-Islam and on Saddam's forces. Uh, and then the book also talks about Mark's career uh, coming back from the war, getting into big data, um, some of the fallout, the psychological fallout of the combat that he experienced, and basically trying to you know, return back to civilian life and, and to find some way to exist in this world. So, Mark, welcome to the show. I really appreciate you uh, coming on today. Yeah, thanks for having me. Happy to be here. Yeah, absolutely. Looking forward to digging into it. <laughs> Dave. Oh, so uh, first we want to start off with a word from our sponsors, uh, our friends at ATAC Fitness. Hey, if you guys are getting ready for a selection of any type or if you are just getting back into shape or staying in shape, uh, check out our friends at ATAC Fitness. They sell these great uh, fin kits uh, and finning is something that you have to do in most selections. But, uh, and also fitting is a great way just to stay in shape. You know, it's easy on the joints. Uh, as you get older, you can't, you can't do the running. You can't do all that stuff. And fitting is a great way to do it. Uh, they sell these packages. They have these really high quality um, hard rubber fins with vents, open heels. Very nice design. Uh, very good for that. Um, and these are different than scuba fins, uh, you know, so don't go to your local scuba shop and buy like the closed heel scuba fins. They tend to be softer. Uh, they're easier to do, but they also don't propel you as much. Um, with these kits, you get masks. They have both these low volume masks and also high volume masks. If you need to like do purging exercises with them, uh, you have a little, they give you a couple pieces of line so you can practice your underwater knots and, uh, and a snorkel uh, so that you can A, <clears throat> practice purging your snorkel, but two, uh, B, also, um, you know, a lot of things that people have a problem with during selections and using this kind of stuff is claustrophobia because they're not used to it. And so actually getting some real good time under a snorkel um, is, is a good way to kind of develop those breathing habits and everything. Uh, so check out our friends at ATAC Fitness, A-T-A-C Fitness.com. Use promo code TEAM10 for 10% off. ATAC Fitness selection starts here. All right. So, Mark, first question that we always ask our guests is about their origin stories. Tell us about uh, your upbringing and kind of how that led you towards military service. All right. Yeah, I kind of, I guess I describe myself as a New England hick. So, um, grew up in the sticks of Eastern Connecticut which, yes, there are sticks in Connecticut. Um, and, you know, kind of a country country boy, fishing, trapping, hunting, you know, shooting an AK off the patio in the backyard. <laughs> you know, not a full auto one, though. So I grew up like that. My dad was in Vietnam. Um, he was a combat vet in the infantry. Um, actually, a lot of my early childhood was watching him recover from a ton of in You know, he got shot five times, wow. three Purple Hearts a silver star um you know he had, a, he had a rough go at it so i grew up watching him uh teach you know coach our soccer team in a wheel from a wheelchair um you know and at one point i think his jaw was wired shut because he got shot through the jaw and he was like used a chalkboard to coach us um so i grew up with that kind of awesomeness i would say <laughs> and my grandfather was a marine in the uh he was a marine during world war ii so I had veterans, you know, going all the way back. So I always thought about the military as a thing. School bored the crap out of me. You know, I could not imagine myself, like, going from high school to this thing called college that I didn't even know what it was, really. No one in my family even knew what that meant. Um, so I was definitely, you know, on track to join the military, and I did at 17. So, yeah, it's kind of my 
I think it's probably a fairly typical background, actually, for well, like a military. Two questions. One, so yep. when your dad was coaching soccer and he wanted to yell at you guys because you weren't doing your job, would he write in all caps with exclamation points? Yeah, kind of furiously write, you know, <laughs> with, the, with the little chalkboard. That's awesome. Um, he's on crutches sometimes, too, so he'd throw the crutch. He was famous for throwing the crutches. And, you know. That's awesome. <laughs> we won the Connecticut Shoreline Championship like three years in a row, though, when he when he coached it. So. Well, it just goes to show cool. what all caps can do. <laughs> um, well, yeah, that was only one little stretch of it. but. Well, and then yep. when you joined the military at 17, did you leave high school early for that? Did you graduate? How did that all No, happen? I graduated. Um, I was only 17 in boot camp for like a week, okay. I think. And I was, so I was 17 when I graduated, but I left for boot camp before Benning. Like, um, I think it was less than a week after graduation. I don't remember, like July of 1991 and so, yeah. then you did what five years in the infantry before going to SAS yep. that's right I did uh I went to Hawaii as my first so I went to Fort Benning 11 Bravo um, loved it actually like I was friggin pumped you know coming out of there dying to go somewhere I went to Hawaii for my first five years um I'm a pretty big dude so I was a 60 gunner immediately uh, back then. And then I actually went from, uh, the, you know, like the regular line platoon infantry to the, I tried out for the scouts, uh, the scout platoon. And, uh, I, I got into the scout platoon. So I did actually most of my infantry time as like a recon team guy, like a five or six person squad. Um, all the leadership was ranger bat guys. You know, like I think my first squad leader there, was a corporal who had like jumped into Panama well they think first ranger bat so that's what got me interested actually in going into like special ops was the scout thing so I went to like ranger airborne air assault EIB sniper all that stuff while I was in the while I was in the infantry but you know I wanted to do something special ops um I always was kind of fascinated by the green beret thing it was kind of mysterious and like everybody told me about the Rangers and I'm like, that was awesome, but it sounded very infantry to me. So, but green berets sounded like a totally wazoo kind of thing, you know, with the whole resistance forces and all that kind of stuff. So that's, that's where I went from there. You know, what did you think about the, uh, the, the special forces training once you went to the Q course, uh, this is the 1990s. I just want to remind people prior to nine 11, yeah. it was a quote unquote peacetime military at the time. Yeah, so I went to your. I went in '96. Uh, was when I went to um, selection, right? Ninety, yeah, '96. Started the Q course in '96 and graduated in '97. Um, so I don't know. Then it was very geared towards kind of your classic UW scenarios. Um, I don't think people that showed up there thinking they're going to do like door kicking and stuff were very disappointed. Um, you know, it was or at least that was my take on it. I expected to learn how to like, you know, infill a country in a donkey cart and like train indigenous people to, to like to do stuff. I'd always, I've always read like the Montagnards Vietnam SF stories with like mm -hmm. the nuns and all that. Um, I don't know that. So that was what attracted me to it as well. Reading all those books. So when I went, you know, it was, it was kind of what I expected. Um, especially Robin Sage, actually. And uh, I don't know. I, it didn't really surprise me, to be honest. I, I was either that or I was too dumb to really take that much notice of what was going on, and I just kind of rolled with it. That was very possible. <laughs> and then you got assigned to 10th Special Forces Group. What was your language? German. Okay. Yep, I did four-month German. This is back, too, and we didn't go to SEER school as part of the pipeline. So I've never, I never went to SEER school. Um, through my whole time. Um, but yeah, four month German language was, was my thing. And then and when we were kind of, no, go, go ahead. Uh, I was just going to say, when you got assigned to your team in 10th group, um, what was it like getting there at the time? Was there a mission that you guys were, your team was assigned to that you were training up for? Yep. It was, we were, you know, I knew that we were destined to go to Bosnia or somewhere in the Balkans, like while we were in the Q course, those of us who were told, I think we got told right before language school, what group we were going to, I guess, obviously you'd have to then. And then like, 
somebody contacted me from 10th group at some point and they're like you're going to bosnia like as soon as you get to 10th group that was the flavor of the day in 10th group doing this mission called the joint commission observer thing which was you know i, I wrote about this in my book it's where the, the green berets were living in houses like rental houses all over bosnia just really you know building rapport with locals and reporting what was going on so i knew i was destined for that um i mean I, I was still you know at that point i was kind of your what it was i was like 23 i guess kind of dreaming of the big war you know was, right you don't become a green beret because you don't want to go to a war right you know like it's like an nfl player you want to play in the super bowl so you know i always dreamed of doing something like i always read about in like the vietnam era sf guys um bosnia I, I probably didn't pay much attention to what bosnia was going to be uh but i was pumped to go you know i was going somewhere and that was cool and so yeah bosnia was not the big war that you were hoping for at the time no. but, but there was in, in your book there was a lot of interesting things that you got to do and, and you kind of did yeah. do the real sf mission there in a sense uh, that you're going, totally. and you, you were living off the local economy, embedded with the local population, just kind of rubbing shoulders with people and, and saying hi and seeing. You know, today we'd call it gathering atmospherics, I think would probably be the term. Right. Yeah, that's a good way to put it. But it is like all those core things that go into UW were definitely like exercise there, you know, mm -hmm. going into an area brand new. You got to build rapport with people so they tell you things. Um living completely you know living off the land i guess in the modern sense of the term like we got per diem and we lived completely local uh we rented a house you know we had neighbors that we like waved to you know we bought beer from the dude on the corner like you know it was we lived there basically so like the whole you've heard the term going native you know too in the in the sf world and i would say that we were totally going native like all over bosnia um, and yeah, you know, I also learned some stuff about just war, like hearing from the Bosnian people about the war, and, um, you know, how that whole thing went down. It was, it was crazy, but yeah, totally. You know, at the time, I think we were all kind of disappointed in that mission. Like, oh man, we're not, you know, we're not slinging lead and we're not, you know, le leading people on charges against whoever, um, but in hindsight, when I look at that, like that was a super valuable like mission. I mean, it actually related to um, stuff we did later in like Iraq, you know, where you you just get a cuss. It's a lot of people don't realize how important like people skills are to the Green Beret just mission compared to other I think soft units. I don't think it's comparable. <laughs> like you need to be able to be friendly with people and like. Um, so they help you and want to do stuff for you. I don't know. And Bosnia was a big one for that. You said in the book that you developed a, a huge resistance to alcohol because you'd have these meetings oh, throughout the day and everyone busts out the Rakia. <laughs> yeah, dude. Like anybody who hasn't been to, to Bosnia, like you don't go there and not drink. Like it's almost like going to Russia and you don't drink vodka. That's not going to happen. So yeah, what we did, like the way we operated there was we would meet with different kinds of people like mayors chiefs of police um, religious leaders and just regular normal people military too and we would deliberately meet with these people it was like our job to go meet with people we were almost like an ngo but with the job of reporting what people say and what's going on um, so we were literally like through our interpreters and we had business cards and stuff they would hand out and like we would usually do like two or three meetings a day with different people. You know, like for instance, in the morning, we'd hit like the chief of police. Then we'd go have lunch with somebody, some random, maybe military guy. And then uh, afternoon we'd hit like, who knows, like a church or something on the way back. Each time though, <laughs> to, your, to what you're saying, you're busting out the rakia or the, what they call Slivovitz. Rakia is like the plum variant of Slivovitz. Um, and man, you get you get hammered. Basic, you're hammered all day, almost. Like <laughs> by the time all of us left there, not just me. Like man, we could put down like some serious liquor. And this stuff is all home brewed, hardcore stuff. It's kind of like moonshine, I guess. You yeah. Can compare it to. 
but yeah, I have a ton of memories with that stuff, you know, just, just hanging out with people and listening to them tell us, tell us about like Bosnia and the war and how the, how Yugoslavia fell apart. Some people didn't even know it was happening. And next thing you know, there's like a Croatian tank, like rolling through your town or, wow. and they don't even know why, like just amazing stories uh, from people. Yeah. Did you guys do a train up prior to that? Like the people would now going to Iraq or Afghanistan, they'd train for the environment. Did they have something yeah. like that in place for you for Bosnia? Yeah, we did what we used to call PMT. I don't know if they still call it that, you yeah. know, pre-mission training where we, what, what we did for that mission. So when, as that, that mission was called JCO joint commission observer, we, all we carried was a concealed pistol. We had no long guns, no equipment, no you know headgear. We also didn't wear any patches or rank. So we were we were our status was like we directly reported to NATO command. So like it was kind of cool because I was like I think I was an E5 on my first tour over there, and I would go to like brief like senior officers on like what's going on with no rank. They knew we were like spec ops guys. Um, and we would, you know, just, we had a, almost like a special status. It's kind of neat over there. What was your second question you just said? I think no, that, that it. was it. If, if you okay. guys did a train up, basically. Oh, yeah, the that. PMT. So for that mission, since all we had was, you know, we're walking around town like normal people with concealed pistols. Everything was geared around reactionary stuff, like a restaurant scenarios. Like we did whole restaurant scenario PMTs where... You got two dudes sitting at a table, then you get threats from different angles, and we went through drills around that. Another one was like roadblocks and stuff were kind of a threat because we were freedom of movement, so it's possible that somebody could like block us and kind of like a more unconventional threat type scenario: car shootings, motorcyclers with like submachine guns. Those were the threats that we. PMT for. Uh, I, I was wondering, Mark, if you could tell the story about, because I mean, this was a, a war zone or, or had been until recently where some really horrible mm -hmm. atrocities had taken place about the, the yep. well, the well full of heads. Yeah. So one of the things we did was accompany a bunch of these NGOs who were there doing like demining. Uh, but also there were people just uncovering and finding mass graves of people. So you know, for people who don't know, Bosnian war was horrendous. You know, you had the Croats, Serbs, and Bosnians. The Bosnians are Muslim. And at different points, they all fought each other. Um, and the area I was in on this first time with this heads in the well scenario was that was in an area actually where the Serbs, Croats, and Muslims fought each other at different times. And, uh, yeah, there was one in the mass grave of probably, I don't know, 20 people or something. And everybody had had their head chopped off and with their hands tied, you know. And then a well over, I don't know, 100 feet away or something was full. A well, like a, and it was like an old school well, like probably hand dug type stone thing was full of these skulls and heads. And at that point, this was 97, so there was still some skin and stuff on these heads so that's the kind of horrendous stuff uh, that we saw over there you know so we're watching people dig this stuff up and there are other ones with like people shot in the back of the head and pigs thrown in the grave and those were probably bosnian muslims with the, the pig desecrating them you know there's just a lot of a lot of a lot of stuff like that that went on there and we we got you know we got to see some of that i was in that could you also talk about Operation Vodka Chaser, where yeah. you guys were over there when the Russian military decided to make an incursion yeah. uh, into Serbia, and that like kind of changed your mission in a lot of ways? Totally. Yeah, so this was the second time my team went over there. Um, I was on ODA-081, by the way. And uh, the second time we were in Birchko, Bosnia, which is on like the northeastern side. Um, and the Russians were over on the eastern side of Bosnia, which borders on Serbia. And you got to, this is 1999, so we're on the verge of bombing Serbia um, because of Kosovo, what's going on in Kosovo. So the Russian, this was almost like a major international like incident that took place in 1999. 
Um, the Russians picked up and started moving into Serbia from Bosnia. So like we went from doing this drinking, you know, drinking buddy mission, you know, where you're, you're getting hammered every day, three times a day to the Russians are about to cross into Serbia. All these different SF teams spun up to just go, you could call it like a weird recon, like a totally overt recon of these Russian troops. So it's, it's almost funny, you know, in hindsight. So we, we spun up my team and we got kind of assigned where we're going to go watch. And there's this area, I think the town was Belina, which if you were to look at a Bosnian map, it's basically Eastern Bosnia, right alongside Serbia. And we went there to watch, you know, we got tasked to go find where they're crossing, how many are crossing and just, you know, report what, what was going on, kind of just reporting movement. You could call it like this, the weird salute report, you know. So we go out there uh, in a SUV, like three or four of us, and uh, pull up. We pulled up kind of, you know, we're, we're thinking we're doing some kind of recon a little bit, or I was. I'm like, hey, we're about to recon the Russians. What we end up doing is just parking down the road a little bit from their huge convoy that was lined up um, and just kind of hanging out. And then funny like these there's one R russian guy i think i put this in my book like blonde haired russian dude comes up and wants cigarettes so we start talking to him and like next thing you know like we're bringing him pizza and like <laughs> we're smoking and joking with some of these guys uh and then eventually they rolled out and they went into serbia and like they told us they were like yeah i guess we're going to serbia you know there's like regular regular troops you know they don't know what they don't even care what's going on most of those guys were just like pumped that they weren't in chechnya so they're like <laughs> hey you know <laughs> we're uh, apparently we're going to serbia i love the they're, like waving at us when they when they when they I, drove over i love the, the part in your book where like you guys are all trying to like feel things out and like we're, do a recon and see what the russians are doing and then yeah like you said he just comes right up to you and you're like uh yeah, we're here to find out what you guys are up to. And he's like, oh, we got 89 people in our unit. We have th these trucks yeah, exactly. here. We're driving here. Like, it was totally. It's it's not, you know how it is. Like, when you go to war and stuff for real, it just doesn't ever happen like you think. <laughs> and, like, these guys were just basically just regular dudes who got sent there. And they're like, whatever. We're we don't care but it was weird like what what were we what was i thinking like i'm gonna go recon these guys but where am i gonna recon them from like what are you gonna do like stop on the road like a mile back and like sneak through the woods it was like minefields everywhere right in bosnia you know so it ended up like we're just gonna drive up behind them you know park the car on the side of the road and just stand there um there was one incident, though, that, that was really dumb of a guy on my team who was using his, like, ACOG on his M4. We were carrying long guns on this part. Um, he used his ACOG to, like, look at the Russians, which means you're pointing at right. them. So there's, like, a little bit of a tense spin-up moment there where uh, imagine what would have happened if somebody, like, perceived a threat in that and, like, popped a shot at us and we sort of... You know, in hindsight, I'm like, man, that could have been like a big deal. Yeah. You know, imagine Russians and Americans getting in a firefight because the Russians are rolling into Serbia and we're about to declare war on them. Could have been pretty epic. There's a, you know. an another story that I really got to ask you about that you make a, a brief mention of in your book. And I had heard this rumor from special forces guys myself but never heard the real story is you mentioned the seals being sent on a real secret direct action mission to blow up some train tracks yeah there was a i don't remember when that happened but it was part of this spin-up to go to war with serbia while we were in bosnia and i guess they got sent on a um you know call it a direct action mission whatever you want to call it, whatever cool guy term you want for go blow up train tracks so they went and blew up train tracks, and then they got in like a firefight with somebody. And we're listening to it on the radio, and all of us are like, "What are? The, why didn't we just go there? <laughs> and like, we could have disassembled the train track or something. Yeah, like, why did it need to be like a super tactical 
kind of mission. Like, like a we, we could have taken team care of it. Operation. I, I, what yeah. I had heard was I mean, that they disguised themselves as locals or something when they did it, but I don't, I don't know the, the whole oh, story. I don't know about that. I remember yeah. vaguely listening to that over the SATCOM in like our ops room. Um, and just all of us, maybe it was just one of those seal green beret things where we just wanted it to be dumb because they were seals. And like, <laughs> we were, we were like, what are they doing this for? Um, and by the way, the first time I did that mission in Bosnia, I was with seals. Like we, we did split team ops with, with seal teams. So that first, uh, that first, you know, Bosnian trip, my patrol buddy most of the time was like a seal E7. So him and I were like he, we were patrol buddies. So, and yeah. Then after that deployment, uh, you write about how you and your team, uh, or the entire ODA, got really tight. That you guys have been training together for a long time on all these different yeah. exercises, winter warfare exercises. Um, yep. And could you talk to us a little bit about that, and then kind of the run up to being deployed to Kosovo? Yeah, totally. So, you know, when I when we got back from Bosnia, actually a bunch of people left. And then we got a few new people. Um, got a new team sergeant, um, new captain, and like three guys retired or something. And we, we ended up having this new team that was all fairly younger guys. Um, and then we went through uh, like winter warfare training, went to... Um, Alaska. We jumped into Alaska to go to the uh, mountaineering course up there um, and just did a ton of training together um, like crazy. And we, and we went to Kyrgyzstan. It was one of our big things, too. When, so an OEF kicked off. Um, we Actually, no, that was after Kosovo. Sorry. <laughs> I'm getting my, That's okay. we'll my get timing. There. Yeah, my timing is, is messed up in my head. Yeah, no, but we, we just got super tight as a team. You know, we did a, a ton of training, and Kosovo is kind of the new flavor of the day. Everybody was pumped to go to Kosovo because uh, there was actually a couple different things going on over there. Um, and our, our team was kind of a, you know, we, we got a good reputation as a, you know how it is. Each team's got almost like its own little culture. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, you, and a lot of times it, it kind of circles around the team sergeants mentality at times uh, and we had a really awesome team sergeant frank Sosha was his name um he, he ended up uh, as a sergeant major um actually he died of cancer not too long ago amazing guy but anyway we we built up like an awesome team awesome reputation and i'll tell you we were ready to just go slay it somewhere like that was just our mentality we were we were out in Kosovo was like going to be the thing for us. Like that was kind of how we, how we got pumped up for that. And so what, what was the, what was your mission when you hit the ground in Kosovo? This was like early 2001. Yeah, this is uh yeah, I think, I think we left in like February, 2001, something like that. Um, yeah, our, our mission was the, what's called the Russian liaison team, um, which you know, at that time, it was almost like a coin mission uh, to get the uh, counterinsurgency mission um, because the, the Russians. So the, the mission was to be basically embedded with the Russians in the Russian sector of Kosovo, because the way it all materialized after 99, the Russians went in there. Russians ended up owning like a sector of Kosovo and it was the northeast sector. So the Russian liaison team was an SF team basically embedded with the Russians. Um, and that particular mission was kind of, you know, how things are kind of famous in groups. Like, you, you know, if you get a certain mission, that's like where the action is. Mm -hmm. <laughs> like that was the Russian liaison team mission. Like the team before us had gotten into some kind of little firefight. Um, so that was like a, you know, so we were excited about that. I mean, right. you know how it is. Like right, you want right. that, at, especially at that point in time. It was pre nine eleven. Hardly anybody had like a CIB. Right. You know, everybody wanted to see some action. I was right. one of them, of course. So our, our mission there was to go in. You know, live with the Russian. We lived in a house, but right next to the Russian base, and then we patrolled the DMZ with the Russians every day. That was our thing. And uh, at that time, there was a uh, insurgent group um, called the UCPMB, uh, which means like the People's Army of 
these three villages in the Presivo Valley. Presivo, Buyanovats, and Med, you know, I forget the other one, Medvedja or something like that. PMB, that's what those are. It's basically three towns. Um, so it's kind of like the, the Kosovo Liberation Army, which was 99, pre-99. Um, these were, I, I, don't, I think they were kind of like the, you know, they were like the next gen UCK. Uh, but they were kind of, I think they were more geared towards Macedonia and stuff too at some point. But I don't, I don't know the full history on those guys. But they were operating inside this DMZ. Um, and our mission was basically to drive around with the Russians on patrols and, you know, uh, report where these UCPMB guys are and, like, disrupt them if we encountered them. So we weren't allowed to go into the DMZ. Um, but, you know, you know how DMZs go. It's like insurgents love DMZs because it's like a safe haven for them. Right. So, well, so that was the deal. We went into Kosovo. And it's that, like a gun-free zone. Oh. Exactly. <laughs> I want to I want to get into that because there's some really interesting interactions between your ODA and Spetsnaz. I just want to hit up yeah. another one of our sponsors real quick and tell you guys about Manscaped. Uh, one of the sponsors of the show, they are a male grooming company. So if you need to take care of business, this is the company to go to. And and honestly, back in the 90s, it probably took the seals to tell us about male grooming. I mean, nobody else knew about it. But now you can buy awesome products like Manscaped and Look, the Manscaped puts out the lawnmower 4.0, mm -hmm. right? The trimmer. Uh, the trimmer, which has a nice little ceramic shield so you don't get those nicks. Um, it's got a little LED so you can see what's going on down there in the in the, uh, in the the nether regions. Uh, it's it's a nice little tool. We both use it. Yes. Uh, we both use it together, honestly. But, hey. <laughs> um, but it's that kind of world now. Um, uh, they also have uh, a nice nose and ear trimmer. They have the... There's uh, a body wash. The, the body shampoo. wash and the shampoo, which both smell really nice. Um, you can get my shampoo, by the way. <laughs> um, they also have a ball tonic, ball deodorant. Like, they'll keep your jimmies fresh. And if you guys go to the website and you use the promo code TEAM20, you'll get 20% off plus free shipping at manscaped.com. Guys, check them out. There are a lot of benefits. So back to you, Mark. Uh, I want to ask you about, you know, the, the your ODA did probably the only joint special forces uh, Green Beret with uh, joint operation with Spetsnaz. And I was wondering yeah. if you could talk to us a little bit. You, you kind of started telling us about this group that was hassling them on the DMZ. Could you tell us how this mission came about and, and what happened? Yeah. So one thing just to say is the I have still not understood like the structure of Russian Spetsnaz. Like, so the, the unit that was there was called VDV. Mm -hmm. um, and, but some of those guys refer or they were referred to themselves or whatever as spetsnaz so we always there was this one like squad that we kind of you know routinely patrolled with it was kind of like our guys that we always went out with um one of the guys had like the equivalent of the russian medal of honor by the way from like wow. a chechen oh he, he did like a hundred mile e and r route or something the guy was a badass we called him shaky because he was he was all shaky uh, from like combat but anyway so the way that that happened like it was kind of completely by ad hoc um so it was like a normal day where you know the russians come over to the house in the morning we jump in vehicles sometimes we just rode on their vehicles like they had bmps and btrs uh, those are those like six wheel or yeah. track little vehicles so we'd either jump on top of those like you've all people have seen like the russians how they drive around sitting on top of these vehicles so we would ride on their vehicles. Sometimes we would drive ours and they would just trail behind us in one of theirs, whatever. We would just ad hoc figure it out. So that this particular day, we took a Humvee out. I was in the, I was an 18 Bravo then. So I'm, I'm in the, I think I was behind the Mark 19 or something on a, on our up armored Hummer. And behind us was, uh, one of the Russian vehicles. Um, and we encountered this like, dude walking on the road who had like an army belt around his way so this guy's like a kosovo albanian guy um and the, the russians just stopped and like asked him what he's doing and they ended up kind of searching this guy and they found like military related notes or something on him 
it, it ended up being like the Russians took this guy into like custody and questioned because they knew he was like a UCPMD guy and he's walking into Kosovo. Um, so they took him back to their like headquarters and you know basically interrogated him or something. He wisely acquiesced to party wishes. <laughs> That's right. Uh, yeah. So I mean, I think it's possible to those Albanian, you know, Kosovo Albanian guys. I'm, I'm putting words in their mouth, but. A Russian is very similar to a Serb, I would say to them. Um, so they were, it was, I'm sure they were scared. Um, and anyway, this guy gave us the information to where like some base camp was. I don't know, base camp might be too broad, big of a word, but some kind of camp where there was between like he said 40 and 80 UCPMB guys, like some little place. Um, so we rolled out on it. You know, we we're like pack up our shit and let's roll, you know, and go, you know, and go bust this thing up. So I think we had two Humvees. We had me in the front on a Mark 19, uh, another hum Hummer behind us with a guy, my team at a little 50 cal and the Russian in a, I think it was a BMP. It could have been a BTR, but I don't remember. And like, so we, we head out to this area where this guy pointed at a map, you know, to the Russians and like, um, I guess to make a long story short, we ended up finding this spot and we're sitting there looking around like we've been here like a thousand times, you know, uh, and remember, we're not allowed to go in the DMZ. So where this guy is like pointing to, we, we busted out like five different maps, which have slightly different versions of where the line of the DMZ is on. And we decide that we're able to like try to go up over this hill because one of the Russians was like, yeah, there looks like tire tracks, though, like going up into the woods right there. Um, so we're like, all right, let's, let's drive up there. We, we think we're in bounds if we go up there. So we roll up, I'm in the lead vehicle on the, on the turret and we come up over the crest of this hill and it was like heart attack. There's like a gate across this, this trail turned into like almost a little dirt road, you know, kind of like if you've ever been in the backwoods somewhere in like the deep South, when I say road, that's what I mean like barely two tire tracks through a forest. Um, and there's like this little wooden gate across that, that road with a sign on it that says stop UCPMB. And there, and it says in English stop, which was kind of weird. But anyway, um, <laughs> and there's this dude, young, like, you know, UCPMB guy in like full uniform with a beret on and stuff and an AK. And we would come rolling up over the hill and this guy was like oh my god <laughs> what, what, you know nato's here or whatever you know they're probably super surprised he didn't actually like pull the ak and try to shoot at us or anything he was so stunned and by the time it was within seconds like the dudes in my vehicle had dismounted and like disarmed this guy my team sergeant like broke this gate down it, it was like literally a log on a it was almost like a stick with a sign on it. So it wasn't like a big thing to do. So he ripped, he also ripped the sign off, of course, to keep it for like a, you know, <laughs> to hang it in the bar. Because you, you have we had to. a bar. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. We had a bar in our house we called the Big Whiskey. Um, that, that sign ended up later being put up in the Big Whiskey. Um, but anyway, so we ripped that down. And then we're like, what are we going to do now? The Russians like dismounted. Uh, and they're like flanking through this. This is like a thick evergreen forest up there. Uh, Kosovo is beautiful, by the way. It's like, have you ever been in like Vermont? I would say it, it's similar to like that. Anyway, Russians dismount, like flank left. My captain has a Russian radio, I think. My captain was like fluent in Russian. He went to DLI. So he was awesomely like just fluent to talk to these Russian guys. So anyway, they flanked left. And... You know, I don't remember how we decided, but we just we just cruised into this through that gate and down this road. And we quickly realized we're in like a, you know, I don't know how big it was, but maybe a couple acres of all these little pockets, like little tents. There was a car like pulled into under trees and like camouflaged under the trees. Reminded me of like these old Vietnam books where the Ho Chi Minh Trail, they like tied the trees together over the trail and stuff. Mm -hmm. Uh, I mean, it wasn't obviously jungle like that, but there was a there was a little car pulled in and like covered with leaves or uh, branches. There was a tent. There was little cooking sites and like bed down. 
if you've ever been in the infantry and you like go into an area and bed down for the night, think of something like that, but a, a quite a bit bigger than like a platoon would be. So anyway, we roll in there, I don't know, maybe 150, 200 feet. And there starts to be, you know, small arms fire, like popping, you know, I'm up, I'm on the turret and I'm like, holy crap. Like at that point I had never been shot at, you know, and I wasn't even sure we were being shot at. Mm -hmm. They, they could have been like signaling to themselves to like get out or whatever because that happens. But bullets, you know, and then we decided like bullets are actually flying like towards us. Um, so, you know, I admit I was scared shitless. Like I, I'm sitting on a Humvee, like completely exposed. We're, we're in the middle of this thing. I don't know what to expect. A Russian guy had been killed, by the way, like a couple of weeks earlier that was. The, the the story at that point was that guy had been sniped by somebody. So, you know, there was a reason to be scared, you know. So I unloaded, like, a whole box of Mark 19, like, down the end of this trail and, like, swept it a little bit. It looked – it reminded me – it's kind of trivializing it maybe, but it's kind of like the uh, the scene in Predator where they just light up when they first see the alien and they mow the forest down. Uh, it was kind of like a super lightweight version of that, but that's kind of what we did. Uh, and then, you know, the Russians, meanwhile, have flanked. Um, most of these guys probably just ran away, the, the, UC, we, the UCPMB guys. But the Russians did capture like five or six of these guys and brought them back in and brought them back to their base. You know, we hauled them back in. So we basically, you know, you could say we captured them. Um, and, uh, even though that wasn't what we really set out to do. That was kind of like what the Russians... The, Ru the Russians were in charge, by the way, in our sector, not us. So we didn't tell the Russians what to do. That's not the way it worked. We were we were along for the ride. Um, so anyway, yeah, we captured these guys. Uh, you know, a couple of them had been, like, wounded. Um, it was the first time I've seen wounded people. And I'm like, they're hauling them past me. I'm just kind of moving out into the into the wood. Oh, I dismounted with the M240, which we had in the, in the vehicle and went out kind of to the front, you know, kind of your classic raid and then set up for a counterattack kind of scenario that you all, you learn in the infantry, like day one, um, did that. Nothing happened. I mean, it was probably no more than like 30 seconds of, you know, quote unquote combat, you know, a firefight or whatever. Um, so anyway, we, we hauled them out. We also discovered like a pretty big weapons cache there. There was in this one tent that I'm in my mind's eye is right next to that car I'm talking about. Luckily I didn't hit that with a, with a grenade. Like that could have been a serious, there was like landmines in that thing. All kinds of stuff was in that, was in that tent. There was a mortar tube there, which is a place they'd been mortaring like serve positions from, um, so anyway, I mean, that, that was how it went down. It was like one of those things where we got intel from this guy and we immediately rolled out um, with our usual crew of Russian buddies at that point. And we, you know, we, we ad hocly just kind of rolled into this joint, you know, fired, fired off some rounds, uh, exchanged a little fire and then hauled, him, hauled a few people we captured back to... Uh, Back to the Russian base. Actually, and, the Russians took it over, really. And this was a pretty big deal at the time because, I mean, as you said, yeah, not too many firefights going on at the moment. Uh, totally. Yeah. I mean, there were people who, you know, the last firefight anybody would ever been in was in, if they were lucky, like Panama or Desert Storm. Mm -hmm. You know, maybe you'd have a ranger back guy who was in Somalia. Mm-hmm. You know, but that was a rarity, you know. So this is, you got people in there that are, you know, you got, and like I said, NFL players starving for the Super Bowl, you know, going back 10, 10 years. Uh, so like when we, when we experienced what we did, that was like an awesome thing. You know, man, those, those eight, one, those zero eight, one guys freaking got to get in some Right, you know, you got to get in the shit, you know, right. or whatever. Right. So, <laughs> yeah, like, did you guys get your CIBs out of that? No, we didn't get CIBs. Didn't get combat patch. But weirdly, you know, and I, you know, honestly, whether we deserve this or not is debatable. But we got Arcom with V device for that, hmm. 
but without the CIB or the combat pouch. That's somehow. wild. Yeah. Yeah. Which is weird. Like, Jack, I sent you a picture of my, like, shadow box thing. If you look real close, you'll see that Archon would be on there. And, like, that is where that came from. Um, so, yeah, in hindsight, like, after being in Iraq and all that, did it warrant an Archon with V? I don't know. Maybe. <laughs> you know, relative to the time. Well, yeah, I mean, maybe. that's that's the thing as a relative. If you guys are the only people, like, in contact, like, over this extended, you know, peacetime yeah. military, then that's a big deal. As opposed, right. you can't compare it to, you know, post 9-11 when everybody is always in it. And then, right. you know, back back in the States... 9-11 happens while you're doing sniper sustainment training. You're talking yep. about that in your book. And the next deployment for you ends up being uh, to Kyrgyzstan. I was wondering if you could tell yep. us a little bit about that. Specifically, I'm interested in the, the palace coup that you attempted on yeah. your ODA at that time. Yeah. I, I think this would probably go down as one of the dumbest things I've ever done. And, and there's a lot of those to, like, rank, <laughs> by the way. But... <laughs> This one was, so this is how it went. I remember it, I described to you how tight we were as a team. Like we were, you know how teams can become insanely like tribal uh, and you don't even realize it at the time, or at least I did. Um, and then we went to, you know, Kosovo and did this. We were the only SF team in the last 15 years to get in a firefight. You know, we had a massively inflated ego probably. Right. And our cohesion was just crazy. So then our team sergeant left, and we got a new one. Um, and the bottom line is, like, you know, at, at that time, we, we didn't like the guy. Let's put it that way. We, he wasn't our old guy. Mm -hmm. He was way different mentality than us. I think he was a lot more laid back than we were. We were, we were a fairly young team with, I don't know, we were ultra- hardcore let's put it that way and this guy was a you know he just wasn't that kind of team sergeant and we didn't like him is what it boiled down to in hindsight i don't think he was really a bad team sergeant he just what he was what he was we didn't like him uh and i was kind of like the um i don't know i was kind of like the de facto lead actually i was the acting team sergeant in between the old one leaving and this guy coming in i was an e7 um you know, of course, and I, you know, I, I had like almost this, um, I don't know, I, I, I was protective of like my team and I didn't like this new guy. I was like territorial. So when we went to Kyrgyzstan, um, this guy, we didn't think he was doing a good job. I didn't think he was, um, a bunch of stuff happened. And basically I, we almost kind of mutinied this guy where we were like, we're good, you just hang out <laughs> and uh, we're going to run stuff the way we always do it. And uh, I did like a one-on-one -on -one with the guy to do that. So if, if you've ever been in the military, the, the degree of wrongness of me like doing that is almost unspeakable <laughs> from like the rank structure perspective. So um, anyway, obviously the Sergeant Major got word of that. There was a cool mission, by the way, though, the Kyrgyzstan thing. It was a FID, FID thing. Um, when we got back, basically, the sergeant major royally chewed our ass, primarily me, because I was, I was, like, considered the ringleader. Um, and I got banished to the B team. They basically broke up our team um, to some degree. Not everybody, but, uh, like, one guy went to the arms room, I think, and I went to the B team. Um couple some other guy left too anyway basically my team got you know rogered up in a serious way because of that that um that incident uh and you but were, then you know things things kind of came back together but yeah go ahead yeah I, you were you were like kind of banished um and then they yeah. they also tried to send you to swick and you declined it and yes. added, you lost rank <laughs> over that i did so you got busted a, down to e6 um, yep. But then the big war is coming for you, Iraq. That's right. Can you tell us about how you finagled your way back onto your team before the yes. big one happened? This was a, an amazing time. Uh, <laughs> man. Like this is how bad I want to go to war, though. Like, um, and everybody's like this. Is so the way it is a complicated story in the book. I actually, I actually 
I think I dialed down the detail on this in my further editions. By the way, Jack, you got to read the full, oh, the full brain. You got to spicy, read the full brain dump. The spicy part of it. <laughs> yeah. So um, here's how it works. Like if you get promoted to E7 and you have not yet been to Anok, and you come down on orders to go somewhere. I came down on orders to go to Swick. I'm pretty sure my sergeant major helped that happen because of this incident. I don't know, but I, you know. If I was drinking beers with him right now, he'd probably say it was that's what happened, and I wouldn't blame him. Um, but what what happened was I came down in orders for Swick, and the and I knew it was coming that we were going to go to Iraq. Um, it was it was in the rumor mill, um, and I didn't want to miss that for anything. So I signed what is called a declination of continued service statement which is basically when you, as an enlisted guy, deny a new assignment. Um, so that's what I did. And I did that to stay in my team um, for to the length of my enlistment. So then two things happen. One, I find out that in the fine print of that thing, it says, if you haven't been to ANOC, sorry, buddy, you're not an E7 anymore. You're an E6 now. And also, um, you can never be promoted again for as long as you're in the Army. And... By the way, you just got stop lost until 2035. You're, I don't know if you guys remember when that whole thing went down, the stop loss. So here I am. I'm like, I just got gave up my rank. I can never get promoted because of that thing. And by the way, I'm stop lost. But all that didn't matter to me because now I was I was going to be able to go to Iraq or or Afghanistan, whichever one we got sent to first. So. Funny how all that happened in the span of like a couple months. Um, and also my wife got pregnant and my grandmother died like <laughs> during that, during that time. Um, so yeah, that's that chapter of the and book. And like, so tell us about your team getting spun up for the, the AFO mission in Iraq and, and start taking yeah. us through the, the infiltration. Okay. So this is like, well, you know, I won't bore you with any more detail on the other thing, but I ended up back on my team when a new team sergeant came in. Awesome guy who actually came from uh, Delta as, as like one of the support guys. You know, they have like the um, like demo support was, guys. And yeah, stuff. I think he was. I think he might have led the whole thing, but yeah, all that stuff. He yeah. came from there. He was an awesome guy. Um, he took over the team, and the team got assigned this AFO mission. AFO is Advanced Force Operations. It's kind of like what happens on the tail end of a pilot team mission prior to when UW starts. It's a very classic kind of thing, actually, from the UW perspective. Um, so I got back on the team. We got this mission. Um, you know, and this is one of those things where you get read on and stuff. Like, you know, it was a it was a serious ordeal. By the way, I only talk about the things that are in my book because those things went through pre-publication review. So I'm only going to say stuff that is in the book. Um, I don't know if you, you had to do that with your book, probably, Jack. But I, I went through that whole process. And the stuff that's in my book is the only stuff I can say. Um, so what happened was uh, we were tasked to do this AFO mission, which was to go into Iraq and really set the conditions with the Kurds to bring in the rest of the Green Berets and basically do UW. So it's kind of like the people, you know, probably like the people in the, that set up for the Northern Alliance type stuff. I mean, we were basically the Northern Alliance of Iraq was Task Force Viking. Um, so the way it, it went down is like um, we flew over to Germany and then over to, to Turkey. Um, and we got set up with, you know, rental cars, civilian clothes, you know, and we drove into Iraq in rental cars. Um, and this is like three months before, you know, the shock and awe, like the war actually kicked off. Uh, it was epic, man. Like, it, I wish I'd have been like smarter then and actually reflected on it as it was happening as much as I think about things now that I actually have a brain, you know, I'm like the, the magnitude of it was pretty awesome, man. Like 
there's a war about to start. We're like, I don't know if you'd call it covert or clandestine or low visibility, whatever word you want to use. But we were going in there to set the conditions uh, to for the northern front of the war, you know. And like we drove rental cars for 27 hours straight <laughs> all the way across Turkey. Um, the way we crossed the border was weird to me. Like none of us knew what was really going on. I think my captain did. Um, or maybe everybody knew but me because I was, you know, again, yeah, I, I wasn't I wasn't the super aware guy I am now at that point. I, I kind of just floating through some of the stuff. But um, we went through the border like super just um, casually. Uh, it was as, as if we were kind of shuffled through there. Linked up with the uh, KDP and some CIA guys, which I didn't even really meet those guys much. I, my captain did most of the talking as we drove through this, uh, you know, through this infill. Um, so anyway, drove 27 hours through Haber Gate, uh, northern Iraq, linked up with the KDP Kurds, um, with the CIA guys who were with them and our pilot team guys who were already there, too. Um, and then they drove with us all the way. I don't even know where this was, um, exactly. Um, it was somewhere north of like Mosul, maybe. I'm not that familiar with that, that side of Northern Iraq on the, the north, uh, northwestern kind of tip. Um, but anyway, we, we, they brought us to like a place where we bedded down for the night, uh, and we're driving through mountains and like white out condition snow, uh, which you wouldn't, that's not intuitive. You know, if you're talking about going into Iraq, you're driving through a white out snowstorm through the mountains. Um, we drove for, I don't know, hours, 27 hours to get to Iraq. And then however many more to get to this little, you know, call it a safe house or a bed down site or whatever, where we stayed, um, Stayed the night there, slept maybe an hour or two. In the morning, we drove all the way from there to the KD, to the PUK sector. So historically, if you don't know, like there's the K, there was the KDP and the PUK Kurdish column factions up there. They weren't too friendly with each other. They just happen to have a common enemy. Um, so the KDP dropped us off with the PUK. Our mission was with the PUK. Um, handed us off to the PUK and then the PUK and the CIA dudes who were with them already there picked us up and we drove with them all the way to Asulamania and then up to uh, a place called Kuala Shalan, which is north of Asulamania. I don't know, like an hour or two. Um, and that's where we started doing what we did. Uh, and our, our main mission there was a couple things. One, was to do the shock and awe targeting. So those people who were you know, around then, you know, the 2003 Iraq war, the, the shock and awe buzzword. Um, well, we were at least we were, we were registering those targets. Um, so I spent a lot of time, you know, CIA guy and, and me or a couple of dudes, you know, lazing targets and writing down coordinates. Um, so our mission was to do that shock and awe stuff on both Ansar Islam, IGK, IMK. These are three different, like, blatantly operating, you know, terrorist groups up there, and as well as the Iraqi army. So that was one of our missions, to register all these targets. Um, the other mission was what was called RSOI, uh, which stands for Reception, Staging, Onward Movement, and Integration, which is basically... When the rest of 10th group arrives, where are they going? And like, who are they going to be with? Where should they stay? Like, where, what Kurdish units are going to be with them? And what sectors are they going to cover down on? Somebody had to figure all that out uh, on the ground there. And that was our mission. So out of Kuala Chalan, we tried to do all those things. You know, like... Um, I was personally the lead, you know, lead being a relative term. I was a, what was I, an E6 or E7? And like, my job was to take care of when our alpha company showed up, where's alpha company teams going to go? And why are they going to go there? And who are they going to link up with? Kind of like your typical Robin Sage stuff. 
you remember in Robin Sage when you link up with somebody and they bring you to the G base? Well, we were the guys you linked up with to bring you to the G base, basically. Um, so I, my, my job was Alpha Company. And so I was out against like the where the KDP border was down to the what was the Iraqi Green Line and then all the way up to the border uh, with Turkey. So it was insane driving. Like we spent months, you know, like two months just driving around trying to figure out where are their Kurdish units how many people do they have? Are the little villages they live in like suitable for an ODA to live there with them? You know, we were trying to figure out like composition, disposition, capability of where to put these Green Beret teams. Um, and from Kuala Chilan, it was so long to drive that it was virtually, we weren't going to like, I don't think we were going to succeed. So I think at some point, my captain. Who was it? By the way, I think my captain is the tenth group commander now, Brian Rowan. Awesome guy. Um, but we we moved down to the airstrip. Oh, by the way, our third mission was to fix the Asulamania West airstrip, mm -hmm. so the so that the other teams can fly in and land, which is the whole ugly baby mission. By the way, if you've read about the ugly baby of two thousand three, that was. That was them flying in and landing on the airstrip that we got tasked to fix. So we infilled with like 300 grand cash uh, to pay Kurdish construction workers to like fix that thing. And we had an Air Force STS guy to uh, like certify the runway and all that. <laughs> it was awesome. Uh, so those were the, our three like missions there. So we moved down to Asulamania and stayed at kind of this PUK uh, headquarter building there. Um, for the rest of the AFO mission. And that, that put us more central to like all these areas. So we ended up, you know, we, we, we succeeded, you know, it was a pretty, I think it was fairly successful. You know, we found places for all the teams. We had like a packet of info for them. Like when they showed up on the airstrip, we had buses ready for them to go to their, to their Kurds. Um, we shipped them out. Uh, we targeted Ansar Islam, IGK, and the Iraqi Green Line um, through a bunch of interesting. You know, there's a couple interesting things in the book. That, you know, like when we, the Kurds made a deal with IGK, uh, which is one of these terrorist groups at that time, for us to go inside their lines to target Ansar Islam from their enclave. But while we were in there, we targeted them. So, like, when the tomahawks flew in, and there was, like, 70 tom tomahawks hit, um, I don't remember what day that was, but I remember standing on the building. But we, we killed, like, 100 IGK guys in their headquarters with tomahawks. Um, so it's pretty, you know, pretty interesting, man. Like, to me, that, that was, like, the Super Bowl moment of being a Green Beret. Like, sneak in somewhere, find the... I mean, the Kurds, you didn't have to train them and be, make them a fighting force. They already were. But we had to figure out where they were. Some of them liked us more than others because we hosed them in, like, 91 or 2. Um, so we had to get past that on a couple occasions where people were like, why should we do anything with you guys? Like, when are you going to leave again? You know, so you have to deal with stuff like that. Um, I'm probably all over the place, man. But no, I'll, I'll these, let you, these are great, you know, like, recollections, yeah. Yeah, they're like micro histories, you know, of like, there's just these little interesting things that, that could, happen. Could you tell you us know? about the night, the the ugly baby mission? I thought that was pretty hair raising. And I didn't realize like how close a call that was until I read it yeah. in your book. Yeah, I was glad, honestly, that I was, that we were the AFO guys who are already there and weren't in those birds. Yeah. Like, it would be cool to talk to somebody who was in those birds. I, I'd never have like post- uh, because I left group literally like three weeks after we got back from Iraq and went to SWIC. Uh, so I never really like debriefed people that much of what that flight was like. Uh, but those birds were shot up, you know, they, they took like in our aircraft fire significantly, like to get to where they landed. Um, and then, yeah, like the way that went down too is typical Murphy's law stuff of like, so we had the lights on the runway were run by a generator. 
the generator died, like right as the the birds are coming in. And these birds are coming in like Gen Colonel Tovo, who later became a general, uh, actually he's retired now, I think. Um, awesome guy too, was on the radio, you know, and I'm there. I was, I was the 18 Bravo making sure that we had blocked off the roads for like no traffic could come in there for where this thing happened. And there were like dudes on my team out on roadblocks with the Kurds. And like, we sealed off the entire area. There was like thousands of cars backed up. It was a major event. Um, so anyway, the, the generator died and then some Kurd had an AD with an RPG. <laughs> and like, so there's this big explosion. Uh, and now the, or it wasn't a huge one, but you know, RPG explosion in the middle, you know, at nighttime, on an airstrip that just got blacked out because the generator died. We thought, you know, something was happening. The, the plane started questioning whether they should land. Um, and then I don't know why or how this happened. In hindsight, I don't really understand why we did this. But our Air Force guy, for some reason, he, he, he did what he called a lead the bird by the nose down the runway because the, the runway was blacked out. Maybe the NVGs weren't working or something. I don't know. But anyway, so this STS guy who was awesome, by the way, Air Force guy, you know, AFSOC guy, jumps in one of our, I think it was like the Jeep Cherokee, and he's just driving down the runway towards like where the planes will land and then come. And he somehow coordinated with the birds, and he was like driving in front of them with his headlights to, I guess, help them know where the runway was. Wow. I, I don't, that's my assumption. At the time, I was like, I don't really know why this guy's doing it, but he's the Air Force dude, so he knows what to do when planes, you know, that was kind of my mental model. If it has to do with a plane, the Air Force guy knows what he's doing. Uh, <laughs> so I didn't think about it much more than that. But in hindsight, I always have wondered why he did that. Um, and I'm sure he had his reason. But that was, Paul, part of that hecticness of bringing in the ugly baby. Um, and then finally, like these birds land, right? And they're these massive hulking C-130s pulling down onto our end of the airstrip. And there's literally hundreds of Kurds, you know, just staring at this thing in this like dim light, you know, it, as if like a spaceship landed. It's just amazing. And then you see guys like pouring out the back of this thing. A couple guys are like kissing the ground. You know when they get when they got out and there's a couple of dudes i knew from like back in my company some of them didn't even know we were there and then you know then we linked up with mostly the team leaders and like sent them on their way on we had buses waiting for them um yeah it was awesome man like when i look back on my career one of the reasons why i was able to just kind of move on and feel like completely satisfied with my career you know, I'm not one of those guys that, you know, is crying in my beer about how awesome the military was. Because I got, in my mind, we did on that mission what you are, what you dream of doing yeah, as yeah. a Green Beret. You know I'm, what I mean? Like, I, I, uh, I just wanted to add also throw in there for, for the audience. You guys may also really like to watch the interview we did with Sam Faddis, who is one of the CIA guys there. Um, and he, you can hear... The, everything Mark's talking about, but you'll hear it from the CIA perspective and what they were doing on the ground. And I think it's very interesting to kind of like just look at both of these perspectives. Yeah, <clears throat> yeah I talked with Sam a, a couple times. I think there's a YouTube video of him interviewing me somewhere. Uh, but yeah, we were spitballing together for a, a couple hours one day, or I mean, at least an hour in a parking lot in, when I was in D.C., like uh, over the phone, like trying to figure out where our paths crossed because mm -hmm. uh, I don't remember seeing him there, but we were definitely there at the same time. Um, yeah. So yeah, it, it would be cool. Can, I wouldn't mind watching that. I'd love to see, can, uh, see how that. Can you tell out. us about when the shock and awe did happen? Because you write about standing there watching these tomahawks come in oh, dude. and then what we'll get into Viking hammer. Yep. Yeah, it was awesome. Um, so, where I experienced that was in Halabja, Iraq, mm -hmm. which is, um, you know, way over on the eastern side, right next to Iran, um, you know, south, the southeastern part of northern Iraq. Um, and the, my experience of that was it was me, uh, one of our pilot team guys, 
a couple of CIA dudes and 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 Ken Tovo um, standing on the roof of the Kurdish little, you know, call it headquarters, a tiny it was a tiny little place, uh, standing on the roof uh, because we knew it was coming that night. Um, and the way that it happened was we're up there on the roof, kind of you know, typical SF dudes shooting the shit, drinking tea with the Kurds, you know, doing our thing, um, and we start hearing these things flying through the air. You know, it's like a small aircraft uh, kind of sound. And we're like, you know, you can hear them coming. And then, you know, they get closer and then there's more of them. Um, and man, I, I tell you, a lot of them came almost all at once, like within a couple minutes, probably 30 or 40 tomahawks, like flew over us. Um, you know, over being relative. I mean, we could hear them in the sky above us. Uh, and we're from Halabja. That's, we could see like the mountainscape of where Ansar Islam, there were, you know, that's where they, they operated. They had a huge area where they overtly just lived. Um, people have equated it to like Tora Bora, like this area where just a bunch of bad guys live, train and there was a chemical facility in there, which we'll talk about in a bit with Viking Hammer. Um, but anyway, uh, it's nighttime, pitch black, standing on the roof with the Kurds, drinking tea, shooting the shit. Um, then we hear these things buzzing over our heads. Um, then they're headed towards the mountains where the Ansar Islam, IGK, and IMK enclaves are. And there's like a huge area. It's not like a small thing, you know. If you've ever been in like Colorado Springs and looked west, it's something like that where it's you're looking at a massive mountain range. Um, anyway, the things start hitting the mountains like just uh, concurrently, you know, just unbelievable destruction. I try to describe it in my book. I try to describe a lot of things in my book, and I, I tell you, I don't know. I don't know if I succeeded ever in like com conveying how awesome this stuff is or like how massive, but it, it was like the whole uh, mountain area was just ablaze almost simultaneously with these things hitting in rapid succession all over the mountains. And like, you could feel them all in your gut. I don't know. We were probably like two or three kilometers, maybe you know straight mm -hmm. line distance from from where they're hitting which seems far but it's not that far in that terrain um so yeah that was my experience personally of the sh when the shock and awe actually went down like that was it you know and there supposedly was about 70 tomahawks that flew over us and into those targets um and we had registered all those targets and um, what how, how long after that was it that viking hammer kicked off um let's see for the kurds not soon enough mm -hmm. uh they were getting they were getting hissed to the point of where we were worried about like rapport uh it took us so long they were getting i, I want to say they're pantsy yeah they were worried about ansar islam like well first of all the kurds weren't convinced that those tomahawks did all that much damage um because they were uh, you know those guys are so insanely practical with you've been over there right jack you've mm -hmm. been with the kurds yeah, yeah. you know like they're the most practical, pragmatic fighting force probably in the world. Maybe the KLA would be close, um, but like um, they were like, okay, you're an Ansar guy. You hear things flying through the sky. Things start blowing up. Are you just going to sit where you are or like run away from anything that you think might be a target? So they didn't think we killed that many guys. Um, but one thing we did do is probably take out quite a few heavy weapons, um, like, you know, like a mortar that was like dug in and stuff like that. So that was good. But, um, but then it probably, I don't know how many days it was. I want to say it was at least five days before we actually mm -hmm. launched operation Viking hammer. Um, and the Kurds were worried about the timing. They're like, they're just going to rebuild like stuff. I mean, you guys are taking too long. Let's just go. Um, they were pissed, um, for a when, while. When uh, you finally got everything up and running, 
I mean, this was a significant operation, and you talk about when you, get, when you get out to the rally point, you just see like these like human it, wave of Kurds, you know, in the in the um, traditional MC Hammer pants as as we Americans call them, <laughs> yeah. um, but wearing their traditional clothing, like just spread out as far as the eye can see. Yeah, it was epic, uh, you know, and I'm not like trying to brag by saying it was epic. I mean, I mean, I was, it was staggering in scale, like. So I remember, you know, it was it was still dark when we rolled out to on bike. You know, the morning of Operation Viking Hammer. You know, we you know got up at like four in the morning. You know, ate some quick breakfast with the Kurds, like eggs, you know, fried eggs and rice. Jumped in the back of these little you know Hilux type pickups, um, and you know with a bunch of Kurds and drove out to this little town or village, whatever you want to call it, called Dakon. Or if you were to look at a map, you'd see that is a little bit east of Halabja. Um, and that was basically like the, you you would call it like the assembly area. And that wasn't the only one. There was another one further south that was probably close to the size of this one. Um, where as we're approaching, it was like this sprawling mass of people, cars, motorcycles, you know, however anybody could get there, you know, that was a huge area. You know, I, I think in the book, I probably described it as like a, a square kilometer, literally, of people, like, standing around with, there were dump trucks and Land Rovers with 106 recoilless rifles on them. There was one truck with a ZSU, you know, 23-2 bolted to the bed of it. You know, really just awesome UW stuff, man. Like you got this rag bag, thousands of rag bag Kurds um, carrying, you know, their scrappy AKs. Uh, and then when we pull up, we're like rock stars. Like they're cheering us and we're driving through the, right. we were driving through this thing, you know? <laughs> and uh, so anyway, we dismount and we we try to link up with our general Kurd who was, uh, kind of the lead. So the way we broke down was we had like three dudes, me and two dudes on my team. There was my team sergeant and two and one guy, our medic, and uh, one of the medics, and then my captain rolled with uh, with with the CIA lead guy. So my captain was like, it's so funny, you know, in the in the army, who would think a captain would be like you know, call it in charge or whatever of like 10,000 people, right. like, like a division size element of fighters. And you've got, you know, staff sergeants as battalion commanders. And, you know, it, it was awesome. Uh, so we just kind of got off the, the truck and linked up with our little groups uh, somewhat. At that point, it was super loose and fluid of who's going with who. That didn't really materialize until we got closer to the, the mountains and started really moving up the up the valley. Um, so the way Viking Hammer was structured, too, is we had what we called prongs. Um, there's a couple maps out on the internet of, like, how the prongs went. It was, like, a green prong, uh, yellow prong. There were two different yellows. And there was a red prong. There was an orange. Um, my team split into, actually, a bunch of, like, this is, you know, kind of classic UW stuff where you got two or three guys with hundreds of indige. And then we spread out on my team across two different prongs. So it was me and my team sergeants, little crews on the, what was called the yellow prong, which was like the main effort of the attack that was supposed to go in and secure the Sargot chemical facility, which was by the way, the whole point of operation Viking hammer was to it was possible that we were the ones who were going to find the wmd al-qaeda connection in iraq like that was the thought at that time spoiler alert imagine. yeah exactly <laughs> yeah that's kind of a sad uh you know hindsight analysis is kind of sad on the whole thing in that regard so yeah me and my team sergeant and our two you know i had two guys with me and uh, one of the guys with me went to delta later um, and my team sergeant, we were the yellow prong. And then my warrant officer and two other dudes were on the green prong, which was really the covering fire team for our prong. They were on this high ground ridge 
alongside us as we went up this valley. Uh, and if you've ever seen pictures from Task Force Viking of a guy firing a Barrett 50 cal, that was a guy on my team named Chris um, who, you know, made some amazing shots with that thing on this on this thing. So anyway, that's how my team broke down. And that's how the whole attack kicked off. You know, and we had like phase lines and all kinds of stuff established with the Kurds and with the, the leadership on the SF side on it. Um, so I think there were five or six ODAs in total. The number of Kurds was hard to really pin down, but the numbers been between like seven and 10,000. Um, and the numbers of Ansar Islam have ranged in from anywhere from 400 to 1,000 uh, that were there. Most of them got away before we attacked them. I think they escaped like into Iran. And it was one of the reasons too, the Kurds were upset that we're waiting so long. Um, all the, all the guys who were not just going to die, you know, probably left before we even attacked them. Mm -hmm. Um, but anyway, um, yeah, where was I? So we're, that, that's kind of how we're structured. We roll up into this enormous mass of Kurdish Peshmerga. You know, they, they love us. They're like dance, you know, they dance around. They got their beads and stuff. And like, <laughs> so what kind of kicked the whole thing off was um, these Ansar guys come out and they're like standing on the ridge. You know, you know, kind of not in a not in a perfect line, but there was they were scattered along this front ridge, just looking at us. You know, and this was probably I don't know fifteen hundred meters. Which again, if you're on flat, almost desert like terrain, and you're looking up onto a ridge, up fifteen hundred meters isn't that far. So it's kind of this like in the book I describe it as like a Braveheart scenario, where it's like we're standing there looking at them, they're standing there looking at us, and somebody's just waiting for the signal of like, when are we going to do this? Um, and that ended up being some old dude, Kurd, jumping up on top of that ZSU 23-2 bolted to the back of a flatbed pickup and starts firing off rounds at these guys on the front ridge. And that's when like the whole mob of Kurds just kind of started oozing towards the mountains and like at that point it kind of just self-organizingly split into the prongs and everybody just started to kind of flow um it kind of reminded me of you know how you do room clearing where you got like your move to the points of domination and mm -hmm. all that kind of stuff like imagine that but at a massive miles by miles square area with thousands of people that's kind of how the Kurds roll. They're like locusts. You know, they just go. They don't have much of a plan. They kind of just, I don't know. It's almost like they're, they're. Uh, I think I describe them in the book as like swarm intelligence. You know, like starling swarm. Yeah. Uh, they, they're they like that in combat. Like they, the big blob goes over here and they take some fire and then some people dispatch to take care of that, but they keep moving. And we, our, th our challenge was to stay on the front line of that. You know, that was really our job was to know where the front line, we called it the front line trace. And this is one of the challenges, I think, in just UW in general is like, you got thousands of indigenous fighters. They don't have great comms. They don't have great movement tactics. They just kind of move out. How do you keep track of where they are? Especially right. if you're going to integrate air power, which was one of our things, like because right. you got to be careful. So our struggle was to like stay on this concept of the frontline trace, be able to report where that is, um, and then integrate some air power, whatever we had. We also had a mortar section set up uh, with the Kurds and our B team. The 18 Bravos on the B team ran almost like a fire support center along with the Kurds. So I had like a radio comms with those guys to call mortars. Um, so anyway, like that's, that's how it was. It was all, it was pretty amazing. Um, we actually didn't have that much air support. We had kind of ad hoc. If any air came on, uh, on station, we, we might get it, but we didn't necessarily have birds circling as a dedicated uh, platform. Not that I know of anyway, I don't, I don't believe there was. So anyway, as we, you know, we, we're storming the mountains, basically. Firefights, 
everywhere. Uh, the green prong goes up the hill, and they're they're immediately taking fire. Um, and my my team starts going right up the valley. It's called the Sargat Valley. And uh, no, not too far up, we start taking fire from two different directions. Um, from you know, probably like PKMs primarily from different positions. And that's when we had our, the first call. My team sergeant called in uh, air strike on those guys. So it was uh, the the Gatlin guns or whatever you want to call them from a an F eighteen, like. And that was one of the most insane things I've ever been. You know, you know, in training, sometimes you do stuff with like jets and helicopters. It's nothing like when that thing is flying like friggin' literally. 100 200 feet over you so this thing came like screaming from behind us and just opened up with these you know i guess it's 30 millimeters on an f on an f-18 i think it's 30s it might be 20s i don't know but the whole like i think they made two passes to take out these kind of positions that were set up they were kind of triangulating fire on us and the kurds thought that there were mines in the in the, anywhere but the road so we're like hunkered down on the road, taking fire. Like some Kurds got wounded right then, but once these birds came by and just decimated these couple positions, the Kurds were literally like cheering and dancing on this dirt road, <laughs> and it was like the motivation went through the roof, man. And we just we were literally running, you know, like war cry type stuff, like towards this one village called Gulp which we kind of easily kind of went through, um, you know, and then it, from that point on, it was just, you know, hitting resistance kind of in, in layers uh, along this valley. Uh, like one time we got, so what we would do is we'd go on foot, we'd fight somewhere, we'd be in a firefight and then, but Kurds would like squeeze through and get way out ahead of us. And that couldn't happen. Like, that was bad. We needed to get up there to know where they were. So we would then, like, jump in pickup trucks and try to drive up so we could then jump off again and link up with the front line. So we kind of, like, constant fight to get up to the front. And we stayed in the front pretty well. But um, there was one time where we took some fire and we, like, pulled the Mark 19 off the truck and we were, like, waylaying positions out on this one hill. Um and we threw it back in the truck. We're like, we had a 240. So what we had were like these little Hilux trucks. They were kind of like the, the rear logistics of the front line. So we had like spare ammo, 50 cal, Mark 19 on tripods in those things. And we did like crew drills a couple of times to set those up and use them, put them back in the truck, keep going up. So it was... It was a really like unconventional type battle. I mean, when you think UW, like I think it was pretty. Yeah. I don't know. I, I think of it as pretty classic, man. Like, it was some rag bag stuff with just weird stuff all over the place. Um, but anyway, we ended up the big the big event was going into the village of Sargat where the chemical facility was. Um, that was where the real super intense like battle took place where we were, you know, this is like hours and hours of sling and lead, you know, trying to bust through this, uh, this village. Uh, when I say village, by the way, there's no civilians in there. So this, this is a all bad guy village, you know, think like, uh, you know, I don't know. I don't know. It, it, there were no civilians there. This is all Islamic extremists, kind of like an ISIS area or something you might equate to it they had like a schoolhouse with like books for teaching radical islam and all kinds of stuff like that it was a serious it was a pretty serious place um so anyway the the big event was fighting through sargat um and they were you know, there was heavy machine guns set up along the back side of sargat sargat's actually also a really weird ge geology kind of going on in the book i describe it as like some monster i think in the first edition where it's almost you know it's almost like some mythical i tried to give it like a mythical feel because i couldn't figure out any other way to convey that kind of gravity that i felt um i don't know if that worked but you know how it is artistic stuff with writing <laughs> sometimes you think it works sometimes it it doesn't actually so anyway we end up fighting through Sargat for hours. Um, 
you know, the highlight of it for me was when my team um, took a 50 cal up to the top of this one specific hill because we were getting kind of beat down. They had one of these. You ever see those 14.5 millimeter machine guns that are like brutal, Mm-mm. you know, chainsaws. Uh, and like one of those was firing down from the backside of Sargat. Um, we were pinned down, my, my little crew, for like a couple hours. You know, I was friggin', I'll be honest, like, and I wrote it in the book very humbly. Like, I didn't know what to do. I was friggin', I was kind of just at some point waiting to die. I, I didn't, couldn't move anywhere. I was actually my captain who kind of came bouncing over through the friggin' hail of bullets and told us, like, there's hope here. Like, there's a place up to your right where you can actually go. <laughs> And I was like, it kind of snapped me out of my thing. And like, um, we, we finally moved, but it was intense, man. Like bullets flying, mortars dropping, RPGs sizzling, heavy machine guns, you know, beaming down, right? you know, and anyway, what, what we ended up getting through that when my captain came and saw me, there was this moment where he dropped his map when he came over to see me, um, and then he ran away and then he ran back to get it. <laughs> and this is like, he's running through a hail of bullets. Um, and I was like, you know what? I guess you could say like, the, I'm like, if, if he can run through this shit, I guess we can too. So we ended up bolting over to where he was with his, um, with, he was actually there with the CIA ground branch lead guy and Bothell Talibani was there with him. So I don't know if you guys know, Bafal Talibani, I think, was a serious player in the ISIS Kurdish battles um, later, you know, not too long ago. Uh, and he's the son of Jalal Talibani, who is, te- you know, Jalal Talibani. Um, so anyway, this is Bafal, who has a beautiful English accent, perfect English speaker. So anyway, we, we run over and link up with those guys. And that's when um, it was decided that we need to get some kind of heavy weapon in place above this village of our own that we can, you know, we can speak the language of heavy machine gun back at these guys. So Mm. my team got kind of the tasking for that. And we ran, you know, we ran through a friggin' hail of bullets. And I'm not like, it's hard to exaggerate it to get to where the trucks were. Uh, so we could get the 50 cal out of the back of the truck and then run it up this hill. Um, so we ran, I don't know, probably three or 400 meters across this friggin' open, almost open area. Just getting, it was also scary too, because there was lines of Kurds in depth firing too. So you had to be careful of them just as much as right. the enemy. So there was tracers going both ways and we're, you know, so we're like waving at the Kurds and making sure like, hey guy, Cause you know how it is when you're firing at somebody, somebody can come out of your flank and you don't, you don't, you might not see them. So anyway, we made it over there, um, to these trucks and, um, it was me, the comms guy, Blake and, uh, Ken Gilmore, who we called him Hap, Happy Gilmore, um, <laughs> who, uh, we grabbed this 50 cal. So the comms guy was just a friggin' huge guy. You know, he, he put this 50 on his like shoulder. The, you know, a, a 50 cow weighs like 80 pounds or something. I don't remember. Uh, then, you know, the medic grabbed the tripod. I grabbed like two ammo cans, slung my weapon. And then, of course, like five, ten Kurds show up and just start grabbing ammo cans. And we all just sprint up this hill. It was actually kind of nice at some point because behind that hill we were covered to some mm-hmm. degree. So we just, we were in a rush to get to the top of this hill. You know, we got to the top and placed this 50 kind of by crawling in place. There was a nice little divot up there. Um, So we had a little bit of cover by laying flat down under that thing. So we set up the 50 um, on the tripod and started scanning for like, where's this friggin', where are these heavy machine guns? Um, And we identified there were some like concrete, almost like houses or pillboxes or whatever you want to call them. I don't think they were, they're probably houses you know, Middle Eastern concrete houses um, where one of those was. So anyway, my commo guy, you know, he friggin' we dialed him in onto that building and just we friggin' disintegrated it. Um, 
And, you know, us up there, I think you guys know what a 50 cal sounds like. It ain't no joke. It's like it speaks its own, <laughs> you know, it's got its own language. So yeah. when we're up there firing that thing, uh, there were actually Kurds right down below us. And right down below us was the chemical facility. And I remember seeing it from like satellite imagery, you know, like from the Intel piece. And I'm like, wow, that's the chemical facility right there, right below us. It was, it had been hit by tomahawks. But you could still tell um, that it was it had the fence around it. So anyway, Kurds got. I, was, I remember just seeing Kurds getting shot, like mowed down a couple of them as they were trying to come in from that side. Um, but I don't, you know, I don't know how you know how it is sometimes with like battles where the tides just kind of turn. Not sure why. I, you know, maybe it was that machine gun. Maybe it was just coincidental that by the time we got up there started firing some other units had broken through something but that moment whether it was because of us or not was a pivotal kind of moment where we flooded through sargat it was kind of like i, I kind of related to like an ant farm you know hundreds of kurds just pouring through this little village um you know with a lot of firing uh, it was like a to you know when you think of war you know, like machine guns and explosions and freaking people screaming. And, I mean, that was it. Was that was it? It was pretty serious. I mean, I'm sure people have seen worse, but for me, it was it was the battle of my career. I will tell you that. Um. Anyway, we got through that. Um. And then, uh, you know, this is weird UW stuff. Like we come down the hill off of this, and the Kurds are like, "Oh yeah, hold on a second. And they bring us like a platter of food. So it's it's lunchtime. <laughs> the Americans have to eat. So they bring us <laughs> like you know rolled up little meats and and stuff on this platter. It was we were like, is this actually happening? Like we just you know we just got done crawling up a, a fifty into position and firing and breaking through this thing, and now we're casually having lunch behind a berm next to the Sargot Chemical Facility. So like it was just surreal and funny at the time. Um, the, what, so yeah, what, that was that was the main event, but we kept going. But go ahead, I, you know, I'm probably talking too much. Yeah, so you, you got up to the, your your limit of, of advance, and unfortunately, I recall you writing about seeing some of these guys escape into the Iranian mountains. Um, yeah, but yep. I, I was so, wondering if you could talk to us about uh, the Sargat, you know, alleged chemical weapons facility, and kind of what happened there as you guys reconsolidated around um, that objective. Yep. Yeah. So what, you know, we, we went from what I last described, our little, our little lunch with the Kurds, we continued clearing the area all the way up through another village way up the hill. It was called Daramar. We actually got another serious brawl up there where we had a, we had to call in airstrikes, um, almost had a friendly fire incident with the green prong guys. Uh, that was a big deal. Um, no joke. Um, and then we came back down into Sargat for the night. It was basically the main objective was over. Like we had cleared almost to the Iranian border. You could actually see an Iranian checkpoint from our, our furthest advance point. That's how close we were. Um, and uh, then we pulled back into Sargat and basically stayed the night in the Sargat, in the village of Sargat. So we were in some house and actually had like a library in there and stuff. Um, and meanwhile, and the Kurds started collecting all kinds of documents and intel and all that kind of stuff. And then the, the real interesting stuff happened the next morning when, um, remember, this whole, this whole operation was geared towards this Sargat chemical facility. So in the morning, this sensitive site exploitation team arrives. Um, and I don't even know who they were. Like, I, no clue. I don't know if they were even Army. I don't know. If, I don't recall what, who they were. Um, but they're wearing like space suit kind of stuff, like these chemical suits. And we're, of course, you know, a bunch of SF dudes. We're like, what the hell? Like, how, how come, why weren't we wearing those if we're like, you know, fighting through this thing? You know, what, what's what's the deal? You know, we, you know, we're just laughing about it. Like, you know, we're all basically poisoned with something at this point. Um, but anyway, they came in to do this sensitive site exploitation. Um and this is what, you know, an epic thing to me happened in my medic. Like, so they're trying to prove or disprove, 
um, whether what kind of chemical weapons were taking place. You know, was this like WMD? Probably is what they're figuring out. I'm like, part of that was, oh yeah, and you got to remember this. This is we killed supposedly like 300 of these guys. That was r the rough estimate by the Kurds, and like. I think I describe it in my book as almost like the uh, a zombie apocalypse kind of movie where there's literally a dead mutilated body every 15 or 20 feet for like a friggin square kilometer in this box of Sargat and like um so you know I didn't know this at the time but apparently like hair samples are one of the ways to know whether somebody has been chemical engineering stuff. So my, you know, my, my medic and I, um, Bobby got, you know, the lucky, we pulled the unlucky straw of you guys are going to go collect hair samples from the dead. Um, so we got a digital camera and plastic bags, uh, and a pair of scissors. And, our job was to walk around all day and cut hair off of these dead friggin' enemy, you know, dudes. And like, man, you talk about like gore. I describe a few of these in like ridiculous detail. In yeah, the grisly book, detail in the book. Yeah, and I'll tell you, I did that because, you know, those. I don't want to sound like a whiner, but man, that stuff really struck, stuck to me, like. Even though those were bad guys who would literally chop our head off with a butter knife if they could. There's something about just afterwards seeing the friggin' mutilation mm -hmm. on that kind of scale that, man, both of us were, I think, traumatized, like, immediately. Because mm -hmm. you're, like, grabbing dead people, you know, who's, like, their face is burned off. Your eyes are, you know, burnt. They're blown in half, you know, just unbelievable gore you know and we're we're cutting hair off these guys so you're grabbing them you're touching them you're you know cutting hair uh man i'll tell you like i would have never imagined it would like i don't know like a mess with me as as bad as it did and it stuck with me for for many years still it still does um but anyway man like there's a few just uh, uh you know to give you a taste of the book like one that really stood out to me was apparently like a group of these guys had been hit with like a 106 so we had a lot of 106 recoilless rifles mounted on land rovers and there's incinerary rounds for those if you've ever an incinerary rounds like a friggin fireball basically on a on a when a when the round hits so there's one group of like five dudes on sars Lom guys who had just been my only logic is they must have been hit with an incinerary round because they like all burnt almost together um like a blob almost like welted you know melted wax figure mm -hmm. kind of thing and you know in order for that to happen they have to die really fast mm -hmm. and or they would have spread out or something so i imagined like a, an incinerary round like melted them together and they're like burnt so bad that their intestines like come out and like, and we're we're you know wading into this and cutting hair off these guys. Oh. Like, man, it was friggin', it was horrible, man. I mean, I don't even know. I don't, I don't really, to be honest, like even talking about it. Yeah. But I've been told that my descriptions of it in the book are pretty harrowing. Um, so yeah, they are. If you do, if you do read it, it's pretty intense, and I intentionally went into insane detail to give try to give people a feeling of what that's like to do yeah. something like that so yeah. yeah that was it and that was kind of the end of biking hammer really oh uh, actually there's one more day and to your last question jack um like after so we we fought through this objective you know kick ass everybody's cool i transitioned to this like cutting hair from the dead thing and i'm like man i freaking just had my head spinning and then the day after that, day three of Viking Hammer, basically. Uh, by the way, there were still little pockets of fighting going on during the haircutting mm -hmm. day. Um, the third day, w like we were like rocketing and mortaring these guys as they're like post holing through the snow over into over into Iran. So there's still snow. There's snow caps um, on those on those mountains. And like 
a lot of us were like, man, what? Like, so we didn't kill them all. You know, like the, how many of these guys like escaped? You know, and, and what kind of guy escapes? Mm-hmm. Is it, you know, uh, and you, you start to wonder, especially now, like I wonder, back then I didn't wonder as much. Um, probably good Probably good that I didn't. But like um, the guys we killed there, were they really of any significance? Right. You ha- I have to ask myself, like, what did they really do? And then, you know, I, I write about a lot of this stuff in the book where I kind of think out loud about, you know, I, I talk about this concept of um, marginally successful tactical operations that are strategically insignificant as like a term. Um, and I always wondered if that was one of them. I'm like, does it, was it worse to disperse the ones who want to continue the fight just to kill the ones who wanted to die? Or what would happen if we didn't take that approach? Maybe we should have taken a more subtle approach then what would have happened right because you you also have to look at like aai ansar islam and then like then aqi came around and then like who are the other guys all suna whatever and then you know eventually you get to isis and i always wondered you know and i literally don't know i'm like i wonder how like viking hammer and the mass dispersion of these three groups and then the decimation of the Iraqi military. Like, I wonder how all that contributed to those other groups, like right. rising out right. of the ashes of this stuff. So like, I've always kind of, you know, intellectualized the, the possibility of that mission being, although really interesting and brutal and like SF guy, awesome. Like, strategically what was it uh, what about uh, the chemical weapons facility uh did that th- was that ever verified what, what what was the conclusion yeah um if you i actually never saw a real conclusion other than what i have found on the internet now which i think they did find um a couple different toxins in there i don't even remember that i don't think there was nerve agent or anything like that in there i forget mm-hmm. what they were it was like um man i can't i can't think of them oh ricin was one of them oh, okay you know stuff like that there was another one too i can't remember what it's potassium chloride or something i don't remember they did find traces of stuff um maybe you know who knows i i never heard i never knew through military channels what they actually found never heard and in, in my in my time so all, all i know is what's on the internet so, so- Viking Hammer is pretty much complete. You were in Iraq a little bit longer, uh, targeting Saddam's military for airstrikes, uh, as I recall. Yep, that's right. That's where we went. And then heading back home. And when you got back to the United States, I mean, you had like massive psychological fallout from what I read in your book, from from the things that you had done in in Iraq. Yeah, I did, man. Like, it probably culminated about. I don't know, like a year afterwards. Mm-hmm. Um, one of the things I always had an issue with was the um, just relentless death that we, you know, that we did to the Iraqi military. Man, we were, we just slaughtered them with airstrikes. You know, I always like wondered because we, we had reports of like, uh, you know, like the, uh, the, you know, officers like shooting their own guys and like forcing them to be mm-hmm. there in their foxholes. Uh, there were reports like that. And meanwhile, we're just friggin' slaying them with airstrikes. Now there's a couple things I write about in there that are really harrowing stuff, you know, like, you know, people just getting friggin' incinerated. Uh, just, it's unbelievable. You know, so I think I left there. What was weird about it is, you know, as a, you know, a lot of people probably think of it like, why, well, I, I don't know why you, you know, a Green Beret is supposed to be able to deal with this shit. Like, aren't you trained to, like, be a badass and, like, put up with this shit? And, like, I don't know. I, yeah, I was surprised how it made me feel. And, mm-hmm. like, I actually, you know, I, I, like a lot of guys, I felt like a friggin' weakling for a while about it. I'm like, why does this friggin' bother me? It's not mm-hmm. supposed to. Uh, so I had a lot of guilt around the friggin' slaughtering of Iraqis. 
when really they were posing almost no threat whatsoever. And we were also wondering, like, who's going to be the Iraqi security forces after the war if we decimate the entire military right. until they all until they all just desert? Like, why does this even make any strategic sense to completely decimate the military when right. they're not even fighting anymore? It's at, you know, at some point anyway. Um, so there was that thought, and there was a, a guilt around that, and then just the friggin' gore of the of the. And the intensity of the Viking hammer battle, you know, where it's just, I, I, I kept, you know, so just tense thinking about that all the time. I think it's like, I think it's probably like anxiety, maybe. I, I thought, don't know. I know. thought it was really interesting in your book how you spent, what, like 15 years or, or whatever, however long it had been in, the, your, in the, your military career, like wanting to get into the big fight. Then right. you did. And you, you right. get home and have this moment where you realize, like, actually, this isn't really what I want. That's right. Uh, it, it, it dawned on me. I was like, man, I've been training for this. I tried to get every patch and tab you can get in the Army, you know. And um, it dawned on me, like, and it was for this shit. Like, that's kind of went through my mind. Like, it's friggin' death, destruction, chaos, and in some cases, total nonsense. You know, like... And I'm like, uh, it was just, I don't know. It didn't resonate with me. Mm -hmm. Let's put it that way. When I got back, I was ready to do something else. Let's put it that way. And I kind of resented it a little bit. Like, if you, you know, when you read the book, some people have actually told me that they didn't like this angle of the book of where I was kind of very, uh, almost negative about it. You probably I, read the I, end of that. I thought, I thought it was great, though, because it's a perspective that you usually don't hear because these right. books tend to follow a sort of format, a sort of hero's journey, you know, Joseph Campbell exactly. type, type story. Um, yours is different, and I, I think it's more honest in a lot of ways uh, about, about yeah. seeing that and then having the self-reflection to be like, no, that's not actually what I want to do with the rest of my life now. And you were strong enough to pivot into another direction. Yeah, that's right. And I got lucky, really, too. Um, but yeah, that's I, actually, I mean, that was one of the reasons I chose to write the book was to bring that perspective. Because I know there's more people like that than me, like that yeah, know, come yeah. out of it. And they're like, man, I don't kind of wish I hadn't done that. <laughs> Or at least some aspect of it. Right, um, right. I'm not, I don't think that completely, but I'm just saying. Um, but yeah, and then what, what, so what happened next? Like, I get back from Iraq. I'm a, kind of a mess almost immediately. I mean, it's funny. You go from like a war zone into your, I think I describe in my book, I'm like, I'm, one day I'm in Iraq, literally like 36 hours later, I'm in my, I'm in my living room. Yeah. My ears are still ringing. Hmm. You know, I'm like, I'm still friggin' amped up about like a threat. Yeah. And it wasn't, um, when I say I, I'm talking about, you know, thousands of guys who've gone through this, you know, where it's like, you're still on like hyper alert state. You know, you're just of a heightened alert. You know, what is it? Hyper vigilance, I mm -hmm. think, is the term people use. And like, you're, you're in that mode. Or, like, people are talking to you. Your, your ears are still ringing from friggin' gunfire and stuff and 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 you know people are talking about stuff like you know what you're going to eat for dinner it's like dude i i can't think about dinner <laughs> like i don't i i don't care you know so you, you you don't even know you're safe yet so it's hard to describe it you know i i i tried i actually wrote and rewrote those sections like probably a hundred times each trying to actually convey First, trying to figure out what I even completely thought about it myself, and then try to convey it. Um, but anyway, what what happened next was kind of a blessing. Um, where what I did was I I undid my declination of continued service statement. Um, I don't remember why. I think it, I don't remember why I chose to do that. Um, and then what? Oh, actually, I might have done it because. Um, it turned my PCS orders back on to go be an instructor. Because, I, honestly, I wanted out of the team. I'd been on a team life for seven years about. And after Iraq, I was ready to do something else. I was freaking burnt. Like, And I'll tell you, I was the kind of guy who gave it like 150%. 
you know, I'm not trying to brag, but I was a friggin', I would say most people would agree. I was one of those guys that was, I was hardcore, you know, and I'll tell you, I was burnt after Iraq. I was ready to go to SWIC. Um, so anyway, I, I undid my, you know, my declination statement. And then I immediately came on orders to go to Fort Bragg. And it was with like three weeks notice from when we got back, when I got back from Iraq. Um, so I'll tell you, like I was back and then going throughout processing within like a week or two of being back. Mm -hmm. And then we're, my wife and I are driving across the country from, you know, Fort Carson to Fort Bragg. Uh, and that's where like the whole thing turn it has, takes a super weird turn. And, uh, you know, I'm grateful for this turn. Was I um, back in that day? This was still, you know, roughly the middle of 2003. This is when the 18 Fox course mm -hmm. was coming online. So it was, you know, for those who don't know SF, you used to have like the ANOC O and I course, but they changed that to the SF Intel course. Uh, that was specifically for 18 foxes and i was one of i ended up being brought into that cadre because my old team sergeant from kosovo was the ncoic of this new thing called the 18 fox course and the the aspiration of this new um course was to be really high tech and i think it probably still is i actually don't know um but you know, so like geospatial analytics, link analysis, um, data mining. That's what we were going to do. No one even knew what that really meant. Um, we had an awesome warrant officer, though, that was really driving it. And he, he was the um, he was he was the driving force behind the that. So anyway, I got pulled into that thing uh, just because I knew the guy in charge of it. Um, and it sounded good to me because it was something totally different than mm -hmm. I didn't want to do friggin' honestly, I was done with like, I would have been happy at that point if I never heard a gunshot again, to be totally like honest. I, I was at that level when I got back from Iraq, people can call me a pussy. That's fine. I'm like, I got pulled into the 18 Fox course and that was like the life changing event. Like, I got assigned the geospatial analytics stuff. And I'm like, I don't even know what that means. Like <laughs> GIS, geographic information systems was what I was going to teach. So I know people have used like Falcon view mm -hmm. um, probably. And then there was one called arc view. Mm -hmm. So I used to teach arc view at the 18 box course, but I, like I had to learn what that was and then like build a curriculum for that. So I ended up going to like college. Um, I ended up going to these GIS courses that were like civilians were in and stuff and learning what this is. Uh, long story short, like while I was there, I, I started like writing code, like programming. So I was like geospatial data. I could carve up data with code a little bit. Um, and th that was to me, that was my new thing. I'm like, this is friggin' amazing. And you got to remember, too, this is like the dawn of the big data analytics stuff in the technology space. So I kind of like accidentally fell into this world of this, you know, where the where the tech technology in general is at this like hockey stick moment in history. And I just happened to jump jump on that just by pure friggin' chance. Uh, but I really ran with it. Um Partially, too, because my wife helped me. Like She's like, hey, you know, this is actually something that you can do to get a job someday. Like, you know, and, you know, she's, she's, you know, she's got a master's degree and stuff. So she knew the deal of, like, what you need to do to succeed in the real world. So I, I ran with, with this hardcore, man. Like, I was as hardcore about tech as I was about being a Green Beret, you know, five years earlier. And like, man, I just went, I went nuts with it. Taught yeah. myself how to code. Um, but that won me a new assignment to SOCOM. Um, and that's where it really kind of took off. Uh, there was this thing at SOCOM called the Special Operations Joint Interagency Collaboration Center, which then turned into the Interagency Task Force. At, which is this kind of the beginning of these things called like GIATFs mm -hmm. and all that kind of stuff. Um, at least I think it was. Um, 
And because of my kind of history at the Fox course and I could write code and I was like a big data processing guy and geospatial analytics and stuff. Um, I kind of, you know, you could say finagled my way into this. I was like a tech lead in the Sojixi program at SOCOM. And our whole mission was to like big data analytics on massive amounts of like uh, interagency reporting. So like we had, you know, like dozens of terabytes of reports, you know, and like doing analytics on that stuff, writing code. Like I learned multiple programming languages. So here I am, like I'm an E7 and then an E8 sitting behind a computer writing code at US SOCOM with a bunch of like contractor computer scientists and analytics people. Um, it was friggin' weird. So I went from, you know, Operation Viking Hammer and Iraq to hardcore tech guy. And, and what's funny in hindsight, I spent, if you calculate the years, I was like almost eight years of my last eight years in the army. I was like a technologist, you know, I was a hardcore That's tech That's awesome. Guy. Yeah. And, and I was right so, at the right time too. Yeah. And right at that moment in history yeah. of tech outside of the military, just everywhere. Yeah. It was, I just caught this wave in this little place where I honestly just got lucky, man. Like in my mind, it was pure luck that I, I encountered that. And like, yeah. And that, and I mean, it ended up being insanely fruitful, man. Like I got out, um, I, I, I immediately had a great job. I uh, worked for Booz Allen as like a lead associate. Um, you know, obviously pay being twice as much or more as a, as an E eight was. Right. Uh, and then I dove into that whole world. I've been doing it for, you know, over 10 years now since I retired. And it's friggin' amazing, man. And this is part of my book, too. Like, Jack, you probably picked up on. I'm like, at one point, I almost resented all the military stuff. Yeah, yeah. Because I could have been doing this tech stuff the whole time was kind of my hindsight analysis. Um, by the way, I've come, I've, I've come to grow a little bit more positive. Uh, on that than a, than yeah a you, you did seem like really when i so i guess i read the first edition of your book and you sound like really like down on the initial parts of your career in special forces that uh, you felt like you were a dumbass the entire time yeah i mean i wasn't uh, well i think what it was is that the tech stuff showed me like my potential intellectually I'm like, I, like I can solve these computer scientist problems. Mm -hmm. Like I never thought about that at all in my entire life. And then when I did it, like later on, I'm like, man, what, what could I have been doing this whole time? You know, instead of like, you know, and then when you put that in the context of what did we really accomplish in Iraq anyway? You know, I just maybe I just questioned it all. You know, I'm one of those guys who I, friggin' digs into stuff. So, Mark, I, I I'd like to challenge that just with the the thought that being mm -hmm. like from a military background and and being interested in the military when you're young and and having those ideas. Had you gone into tech earlier? Had you gone another way yeah. and then ended up in tech? You would be one of those guys that you meet in a bar that goes, "Yeah, I was thinking about doing that." I was thinking about going yep. to SF or I was thinking about going Ranger. And yep. I didn't and and regardless of what your experiences are now, had you never gone that path, I can pretty much guarantee yeah. you that you always would have looked back and regretted it and no wondered doubt. could I have done it? You know. Yeah. You know. There's another thing too, man. Like I agree. Like by the way, in for in subsequent editions of that book, I, I actually toned down some of that negativity because I actually changed my thinking. Because I wrote that book in like twenty 15, I think. Um, then I, in, in subsequent editions, I actually have toned down that discontent kind of thing. And, and to your point, like, here's how I think about it now, um, is the character building aspect of it too was mm -hmm. invaluable, man. Mm -hmm. Like right now I am like, I'm a pretty, you know, senior, at least you'd call it upper middle manager. Because to do to get to that level of stuff, you have to have that human factor piece as well. You can't just be some, you know, super nerd who can't even operate on a team of programmers because right. you can't even talk to somebody. So I do. I agree with you, and I actually like that thinking 
was missing, I think, in the first edition. But the the it has been super valuable in my tech career to have the background as a Green Beret. Because yeah. I'm like one of those guys where I can rally up people from like across the company that are in their little tribal areas. Right. In these big companies. And I'm not afraid to like just walk in there and make rapport. Kicking their and door. Saw, and, like, yeah. I'm like, I'm kind of known for that, man. Like, and those type of leadership, those things turn into really important leadership qualities. Yeah. When you start, you know, you back up from literally coding a program to where you're leading like 20 or 30 or 50 programmers and you've got those programmers nested in a 5,000 person organization where there's competing stuff, corporate, you know, corporate competition type space. Like the Green Beret stuff is friggin' awesome for that. So yeah. I've definitely changed my mentality over the years um, to that. But at the, at the, you know, at the time of when I was really coming into tech and the kind of bad taste in my mouth of Iraq, I did have a super negative. I also went to college. Like I took a lot of courses in philosophy. Yeah. And uh, that's part of my whole thing too. Like I was almost over intellectualizing some right. of the stuff. Like I write about some of that stuff in there too, where I really crack open like these weird philosophical debates about the stuff. Um, so I kind of overthought it probably too. And something I was know, still I raw just, too. Uh, you know, I mean, it, it, there was a lot of emotion behind it. Driving. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. And, yeah. And something I would just offer to people, maybe uh, young people out there or, or really whoever, I, not, I, I say this through my own lens as well, but it's okay to be more than one thing, right? Like yeah. You can be a tough totally. guy, Green Beret, and mm -hmm. you can also go to college and get an MBA or, or get fair. your PhD, uh, you know, and also have a Ranger tab, right? Like it's okay to mix and match these things. And I, again, I'm biased, but I would say that can actually help you in your life and your career. Totally. Yeah. Yeah. That's yeah. one thing I would agree. Like part of my whole thing uh, that, you know, I guess you could say I've been pretty successful, like post-retirement of like, to your point, like don't, your identity can't be completely hooked to being a green beret, mm -hmm. like as a person, cause that's, that's going to go away. Like mm -hmm. you're going to get old. Right. And like, it's, you're not going to be one. So you got to have another dimension to yourself. Um, I think that drives a lot of guys crazy. Like they, they yeah, don't know who they are anymore. Like when they don't have a green beret on their head anymore, they don't know how to be, they don't even know who they are. Mm -hmm. Like, and I'll tell you like falling into technology, going to college at the same time, you know, coming out of retirement into the tech industry. Uh, it's a, it's a, it, it's good to be multidimensional to your, yes. to your point. It's like yeah. a load balancing thing. Like you've got backup plans, you know, when, when you, when you get out, you know, let's uh, hit up some user questions here from the audience. Um, one guy, Isaac is asking about, uh, there's a story you tell in your book where, uh, I think it was you and a seal officer, you meet a terrorist in Bosnia yes. and he, he's asking, <laughs> um, do you know whatever happened to that guy? I don't know what happened to him. Um, and I can't say his name because it didn't get approved. <laughs> but yeah, what happened there was in this little village in Western Bosnia, we're eating lunch at some little Chivapi joint. And this dude walks in who we thought was an NGO, um, but he wasn't. He was alone. And we kind of dialed him in. And this guy was, I think it was a bad dude. He was probably like a mujahideen for the muslim side in the bosnian war there was a small amount of them that came in and you know fought alongside that on clay but anyway this guy was probably one of those and um he had been involved supposedly in the beirut bombing somehow wow. this guy wow so like man when when we like the seal and i when we found that out after the guy left and we never saw him again but we were like we're gonna kill this dude yeah like if we see him again it's game over for this guy. But we never saw him again um, to answer the question. But yeah, that's Ian, a good indicator of like the chaos of Bosnia, by the way. <laughs> Ian asks, uh, as the only guy I know that actually used one in combat, what did Mark think of the M21? I loved the M21. I, I carried it primarily in, in Iraq, especially on like some of those Viking hammer 
you know, the firefights were not close range. Like, you know, a 308, you didn't really need full auto anyway. You know, you're, you're shooting at 100 plus meters firefights. So uh, I, I liked it. I, it was I, a little bulky to carry around in a vehicle. That was yeah. the only thing about it. Yeah. But for what we were doing, to me, that made a lot more sense than carrying an M4. I, I, and I, I had a PBS-10 on it, too. Yeah, I would. I mean, even back when I was in during the peacetime military, I, I always thought that having an M14 as, as a secondary weapon system would be awesome. Yeah. A heavier round that, you know, a better, yep. not a better gun, but, you know, a, a, a different purpose gun. The only uh, weird thing about it that I didn't like was the the safety on it. The safety's weird. You got to like push forward on the inside mm -hmm. of the trigger guard. Mm -hmm. It's not as fast. Uh, but again, I w we weren't planning on having like we're not doing CQB, you know, in the mountains of Kurdistan. Right. But uh, it was better to me to ha be a long range shooter because other guys had M4s alongside me. Uh, you know, so. Isaac says, "Was it awkward hanging with Spetsnaz or competitive? Like, were you all watching each other, waiting for the other to turn, having hundred yard stare offs with each other?" Yeah, we did actually have some stuff like that. I wrote in there about this one time, like the Russians. I, I don't. I think it's a Russian thing. They have this thing called a banya, yeah, which is yeah. probably probably their word for a sauna. Or something, I don't know. But they make these saunas insanely hot. But basically, they had like a gut check with us about who could withstand the hottest sauna and the most amount of vodka. And like <laughs> running in and out of this sauna, butt naked. So butt naked Russians and Americans drinking vodka with Russian hats, on, fuzzy hats on, of course, in the sauna. <laughs> and like, then we would run outside and jump in this tank of water. And it would like give you a heart attack. Yeah. So there was that kind of stuff where we were obviously trying to, you know, hurt each other. But while we were out on patrols and stuff, there was little micro competitions too of like who can walk the fastest up the hill when we walk up the hill. You know, you, you were every it's just you know how it is. You, it's even like that on a team, you know, where everybody competes yeah. with each other. We were, were like a team basically at some point. Were any of your guys ever approached for recruitment? Oh, to like to be sources yeah for, like Russian. for russians not that i know of no it wouldn't surprise me if my captain did though since he was a fluent russian speaker <laughs> <laughs> i don't know uh, there was some, we had an amazing relationship with the russians like you guys if you read the book you'll see it it was i think it had a lot to do with my captain's language ability believe it or not because mm -hmm. they didn't speak english like very much at all but he could go in there and just roll Russian, you know. So he was palling around with their leadership like he was one of them. Uh, it was amazing. John says, great interview. Cheers, guys. Alejandro says, dude, bro points for getting to do a legit UW mission. I still remember stories from Greybeards when I was a cherry about Viking Hammer. Interesting <laughs> stories about the ugly baby infill. Uh, he goes on to say, stories I heard was they took a lot of ground fire, not sure if they were pulling our legs, but supposedly the bottom of an MC-130s clipped the top of a sand dune. <laughs> wow. Yeah, I never heard that. I, I believe it. Uh, it, was, I, it was crazy. Isaac asks, what's going to happen to the Kurds now? Like, that's kind oh, of a man. tough question <laughs> for any of us to answer. Uh, and, yep. a, and a very broad question, too. Yeah, because it's like witch Kurds, too. Right, right, you right. Know, yeah, I mean, they can't even get their own stuff together, let alone, like, deal with any, deal with Turkey yeah. or Iraq or any, you know. He, he's also I'll asking you, if you know what happened to the Kurds you worked with. I actually don't know. I, I don't know if the PUK even exists as a as in yeah. a Kurdish entity yes, they, anymore. They do. I, I yeah. don't. I don't keep I don't keep tabs. I mean, I kept a little bit of tabs on like the ISIS stuff the Kurds were doing and I, I saw Baffle on there and I was kinda cool to see him talking about it again. And like I know the the one thing I get hung up on usually is trying to teach people the difference between the PKK and mm -hmm. the other Kurds. Yes. And you know the varying perception of who's bad across that spectrum of Kurds. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so, yeah, we we had PKK around our areas too. By the way, like there were there were areas up in the northern part of our sector, my sector, during AFO where there were PKK like positions on the hillside, 
and the PUK was like, don't go there. <laughs> that's that's the PKK up there. And it was up near this big lake called Dukon, I think. But anyway, they were they were spread out. And once we rolled south with the with the uh, Kurds to fight the Iraqis, there were all kinds of different flavors of them showing up. We actually did like a bombing mission one time. I think it was with the PKK guys. And we didn't even know it until we were done and they told us that casually they were communist Kurds, not PUK. And we're like, what, you know, I didn't, we didn't know that. So yeah. it's, it's confusing as hell over there, or at least it was, uh, you know, I don't know. Anyway, long, long answer. Pat is asking, did you use Dutch V40 mini grenades? Not that I'm aware. I never threw a grenade once. So I, d I doubt it. <laughs> Uh, I, 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 I've I, never I, heard of that. I don't track that kind of stuff, honestly. I, I don't I, read guns I and ammo. I've had stuff. a couple of them. Yeah, I've had some. Well, plastic ones. Yeah. Uh, I mean, yeah, they're, I don't they're, they're convenient, but they're mini grenades, so you're not... Are those the ones that are triangular shaped, like no, a pyramid? No, those are... Oh. If you're talking about the big ones, those are the thermobarics, the large kind of pyramid where they are, they're conical oh, yeah. at the top. I, the I minis are just small, I round. Ever. Yeah. All I ever had was a normal frag grenade. I don't, I don't the, well, and the I never used one. You might be talking about the uh, PDM, the pursuit deterrent mod. PDM. That's oh, what okay. I'm talking about. Okay. Yep. Yeah, those are the ones that shoot the wires out mm -hmm. of the different. Yeah, I, I never had any of that. Those, those are things cool. are actually kind of cool. Yeah, they are. Uh, Alejandro says, thank you for coming and sharing both your story and part of the original's history. Cheers, mate. And oh, where are we? Uh, oh, <laughs> Isaac wants to know if you worked with uh, Ed Snowden at Booz Allen. <laughs> no, I didn't, actually. I think he was there at the same time I was, but he was not anything like I was doing. <laughs> uh, Carl says, uh, Mark, based off your experiences in the Balkans with the Russians, what do you think 10th Group members should focus on today in light of the Ukraine crisis? Wow. Um well, so um, it's definitely not my era to think about the great powers kind of stuff. Um, like, but UW is pretty straightforward. You know, you're always going to have like resistance forces of some kind, even if they're like surrogates or some other host nation military. So I don't know, maybe FID. I don't know. I mean, I'm, I don't claim to be an expert in that kind of stuff, mm -hmm. by the way. I, I mean, but to me, the classics probably come to into play. Yeah, I, I mean, you, when when there was near peer great power with the Soviet Union, you had like Dead A, Dead K, you know, like SF yeah, right. SF had that stuff, you know, planned yep. out and in place. Yeah, yeah, maybe that's the the angle is more of that like, um, you know, Jedberg type operation where you, you know we need to get a lot better at our language capabilities, which I always try to tell everybody like. If you're an SF dude and you don't take your language seriously, then maybe you're not a real SF guy. Like that is so important for the stuff I did anyway. It's amazing. Like my German was pretty good. I always scored like a two plus three or a three good, three. Yeah. Like my my German in the old scale of the DLPT. So like my captain was really good at it too. He used the same kind of scores and like we were able to talk to people directly. Like and some Kurds spoke German because they did like migrant work. Mm -hmm. so there were actually quite a few Kurds who we would be able to speak to and kind of use as our interpreter directly and it was awesome and then what, observing my captain working with the Russians is another huge one like it's amazing what that actually means and uh, something else I wanted to um, make sure we brought up was that you're also a guitar player and you recorded an yep. EP that's like heavily inspired by your military experiences I wonder if you could tell us right. a little bit about that yeah, so that's funny. Uh, I'm, I try to, again, try to be multidimensional. You know, Jack's theme here. Like, one of mine is I'm a musician for like my whole life. I've been playing the guitar since I remember being alive. You know, I'm probably eight years old or something is when I started. Um, I play flamenco, wow. uh, like traditional flamenco. Uh, I like the real deal with your fingernails and strumming, you know, like hardcore traditional flamenco. And also metal, um, which is what I played my whole life. Um, so, you know, one of those bucket list things to me was always to, like, put together a um, an album. Like, I've always written music and 
did it. You know, for those like, just to give you a point of reference, I'm kind of like a Joe Satriani style, or maybe uh, the the more hardcore shredders like Ingve. Ingve mm-hmm. Mousin. Um, so, Ing, like, you got to, you know, knowing my age, you know, I graduated high school in 91. Like, my my years of, you know, you know, when I was a kid growing up, I grew up with the 80s shred scene of guitar playing. Mm-hmm. Like, in my day where I grew up, if you didn't play the guitar, you were just, you were asleep. Like, <laughs> you got to play the guitar. You know, hair bands and friggin' shredding was what it, you know, Van Halen, Ingve. Satriani, Metallica coming Ronnie James into play. Yeah, so, yeah. so I kind of like I, I feel like I'm more, I'm like an Ingve meets Metallica. Mm-hmm. Uh, actually, one of my favorite metal influences was Pantera. Mm-hmm. Dimebag Daryl, who was their guitar. The guy's like the greatest guitar metal rhythm guy like ever. So I like to think I combine like the shredding of the late '80s with kind of that groove metal style. Uh, but like uh, the, the, the EP I made is called firefight. That's the name of the EP. And some of the songs, yeah, they're instrumental songs. Cause I don't, I'm not going to sing, but you guys don't, nobody wants me to sing. So I'm not going to sing. Um, but I've got like sound effects of like machine guns and some of the songs build up with um intensity that you know i'm trying to convey some notion of if you're if you're thinking about combat or firefight or something that this stuff resonates i wrote one song it's called ode to the gwat the global war on terror (laughs) i got like got like snippets of george bush making statements about it and then obama in the end and like it's a really heavy chuggy groove metal kind of tune um but the other ones are just kind of traditional, classic shreddy stuff like Joe Satriani style, a little heavier edge on it. Um, but yeah, I mean that's just one of those things, you know. Uh, so I just right posted, here. I just posted links for both the Spotify and the Apple Music in our uh, live chat. Um, but Please. you guys can, yeah, you can you guys can find it in our firefight under uh, Mark's name, Mark Gio- yeah. Co- Giaconia. Geoconia. Yep. yep, that's right. Oh, there's one other one I wrote. One song is called Neck Aspera Tarent, which was the motto of the first infantry unit I was in, called the Wolfhounds. And Neck Aspera Tarent means no fear on earth. Um, and it's a kind of a cool tune. It's pretty shreddy, Satriani like, but metal y tune. And then th- throw up uh, the new book cover, too. Oh yeah, because I'm this holding. The, I'm holding the first yeah. edition. Mark has the new one here. This is the new one. And it's people, a, can... that's a that's a real picture of me from Iraq and uh, during AFO actually, because I'm wearing a civilian clothes top in there. And people but... can go get it on Amazon. Yep, Amazon. Cool. Yeah, yeah. I I highly recommend you guys pick it up. I, I really enjoyed the book. Um, and I don't know what has the feedback been like, Mark, on the on the book. Good, mostly. I mean, I got a few people who didn't like some of that negativity stuff. And, like, if you read, there's 160 Amazon reviews on there. So it does pretty decent. That's um, awesome. Yeah. It's a lot of it, some of it's thanks to you, Jack, on this first one of these you did with me. Mm-hmm. Really got the word out. And, uh, yeah, pretty good. I mean, I, I think I'm almost like four and a half stars averaged or whatever, however they do it. So a lot of people like it. I get a ton of feedback through LinkedIn too. By the way, connect with me on LinkedIn. I, I'll, you know, I answer tons of people's just questions on there all the time, um, and I get a ton of feedback. I, I get everything from like, dude, you got it all wrong. You know, everything you did was awesome. Or, or some people are actually mad about some of the stuff I wrote in there, where they think I'm just whatever, trying to be an uppity asshole or something. Um, but most people like it and they like it for the reason you said, Jack, where it's not your average, it's not your typical playbook for a vet for a, for a memoir. It, it digs into stuff and I question some of it and, you know, and make, and I did it on purpose to make people think about it, you know, like, don't just think that everything you did is maybe was all that effective maybe it, maybe it was maybe it wasn't but you, maybe you should think about it yeah that's that's all i was doing is trying to encourage people to actually like 
explicate your experience and think about what it means. Like, um, and some people don't like that, you know, they don't like, go figure. <laughs> it's kind of anti-intellectualism is what I got a little bit of. Um, but at the same time, like, you know, I, I have revised the book. It's third edition right now where I did tone down some of that. Cause I changed my own mind about mm -hmm. some of it. And some of it was because of, you know, some of the stuff we talked about today of like, some of it is meaningful, regardless of whether you thought the strategic significance wasn't there. Like, for instance, your the, the the reason catastrophe with like pulling out of Afghanistan or whatever, you know, people feeling like, you know, it's the end of the world. Uh, you know, what what they did was was worthless or, or whatever people are thinking about it. Like, um, you know, personally, I wasn't surprised how it went down like when we pulled out at all and then like just think of your experiences and how they how they grew you as a person you know and because you couldn't control the situation anyway like that's kind of anyway so all part of just actually thinking about stuff you know I, which a lot of people hate doing uh these days <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> so anyway, I'm probably, you know, rambling now. No, but. it's no, awesome. No, it's good. Uh, I, mean, I I think that a lot of that comes down to, you know, everybody has a unique experience. I mean, two people could be in the same foxhole, go through the exact same battle and come out, come out on the other side, feeling completely different about it. Yeah. And, and I, I, everybody, everybody's opinion, everybody's feelings are, are absolutely valid in the way that yeah. some people, like probably probably some of the guys on your team weren't bothered at all by any of that. Totally. And some yep. of the, and, and some of the guys were and, and it doesn't make anybody right or wrong. And I think that as veterans, one of the things we need to do is come together on these things and just respect how yeah, exactly. you know everybody else's experience. Yeah, I totally agree. And like I, part of my whole you know reason for writing a book at all was like first I just wanted to write one, but I part of it was to help me figure out what do I think about what I did. Right. 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 You know, it was almost, you know, cathartic in that way where I'm like, I'm confused about how I feel about some of the stuff I did and we did whatever. Right. I'm going to write about it and I'm going to, part of my goal of writing about it is to really pull it apart. It's almost like if you've ever done like behavioral cognitive therapy type stuff, like it's one of those, like ask yourself why you think something is bad or good. Right. And make yourself explain it to yourself. <laughs> so like, you know, and that's, that was part of the reason I wrote the book is to help myself figure it out, but also to provide a perspective that I didn't see in any other book, which was tell the actual genuine truth about what you're thinking about what you did instead right. of this, temp this templated, yeah. you know, like Billy badass thing where, I just, that's not who I am. Like, I'm not going to be like that no matter what. But, like, I wanted to I wanted to write a book that gave people a different perspective. Right, that's, right. And, and again, yeah. like, that's your truth. It, it doesn't necessarily mean that the people who write the Billy Badass books are, are lying or presenting yeah. a front. Maybe they just don't, you, you, they just, yeah, totally. those things didn't bother them or whatever. You know, like. Yeah, and I, and know, again, quite, I know guys like that. Yeah, and, and it's one of those things where, again, I, I feel like everybody's story deserves to be told or everybody deserves has the right to tell their story and yeah. and nobody's story it, it's true for them right i mean yeah, it's exactly. the truth for them and yep, we know, we're really their, happy their, yeah them being genuine yeah you know is what it really uh, amounts to right yeah and honest with yourself you know and that's kind of what i was trying to do yeah absolutely so, you guys check out one green beret uh definitely pick it up um and uh, next Friday, we're going to have Andrew Milburn, or I'm sorry, it's actually going to be Saturday. We moved the show from Friday to Saturday, so we're at a, a new time for next week's episode. We'll be here live Saturday, 8 p.m. with uh, Andrew Milburn coming oh, back on the show. Oh, he's going to be here Saturday? Or uh, No, he's going to be here Saturday, the 29th. Awesome, awesome. Uh, one thing about your book, I want to tell everybody, it is on Kindle Unlimited. So if you have Kindle, if you have Amazon Prime, you can right. read it for free. Download it, read it for free. Mark still gets paid for it. So yep. check that out for sure. And uh, please like and share and subscribe to the channel and all that good stuff. 
give us a review on iTunes or whatever. Spread the word around about us. Uh, down in the description, there's a link to our Patreon if you want to get access to the bonus segments we do and uh, and support the channel and help us grow. Manscaped. And, Manscaped. and Manscaped? Yeah, check out Manscaped.com for your male grooming needs and use Team 20 to get 20% off and free shipping. And thank you for everyone for joining us tonight. Really appreciate it. Thank you, Mark. We really appreciate your time. Yeah, thanks for having me. Awesome. Time. Absolutely. All right, yep. so we will see you guys on Saturday. Saturday. Take care, everyone.